ABC Wednesdays. Y'all can play all day. We want books. We want paper towels in the classroom. Bet you want raisins, too. I'm Honey. still waiting on the paper towels. Abbott Elementary returns with the new season. We asked the district for more after-school programs. They gave us $50 for class pets instead. Critics cheer. Abbott Elementary continues to be one of the funniest and most beloved shows on TV. What y'all doing out there? Taking bribes. Proud of y'all. Abbott Elementary, Wednesdays, 930, 830 Central on ABC and stream on Hulu. Hey, it's me, the Quenchies. I'm that late afternoon craving you just can't shake. Wait, what's that? Welch's Grape Aid? No! Made with real fruit and no added sugar, nothing answers the call of the Quenchies like Grape Aid. Got the Quenchies? Grab a Grape Aid in your juice aisle. Imagine the softest sheets you've ever felt. Now imagine them getting even softer over time. That's what you'll feel with Bolin Branch's best selling signature sheets in 100% organic cotton. In a recent customer survey, 96% replied that Bolin Branch sheets get softer with every wash. Start getting your best night's sleep in sheets that get softer and softer for years to come. Try their sheets with a 30 night guarantee, plus for a limited time, get 20% off your first order at bolinbranch.com code SPAN. Exclusions apply. See site for details. Joanna. Hello, Nate. And hello to all of you. We are Stranger Than, a podcast discussing unsolved mysteries, weird occurrences, misunderstood phenomena, and creepy happenings. And so this episode is going to be about Hollow Earth, but first we need to give a shout out to a very awesome kick-ass chick named Jenny. And what is Jenny's? It's Cthulhu Art. Cthulhu Art. And her Facebook page is facebook.com slash catthuluart, C-A-T-T-H-U-L-U-A-R-T. And that's where she has all of her art. She is the one that did the new Stranger Than art, as you may have noticed we have. Yeah, the profile picture, which is super awesome. And she is open for commission. She bases the price on the individual pieces, and payments can be taken via PayPal. Right now, shipping is limited to United States. So check her out. All of the art on her page is for sale unless otherwise marked. Today we're going to be talking about Hollow Earth. Or the theory of Hollow Earth. The theory of Hollow Earth. What we know, what the accepted makeup of our planet is, what science tells us, is the Earth consists of four layers. The outermost layer, the one we live on, is called the crust. At the very depths of the ocean, the crust varies from 3.1 miles to 6.2 miles thick, which is 5 to 10 kilometers, and ranges from 22 miles to 43 miles, which is 35 to 70 kilometers, thick on the continents. It's weird that it's thicker on the continents. Well, the oceans are down lower into the crust. Yeah. And, like, mountains come up off the ground I would have just thought that maybe to support the oceans... There would have been a thicker crust, but I guess since it's actually, Earth is actually fucking solid. Well, there's, we'll actually that, get that, into the yeah. whole thing at the bottom of the ocean because that's something to talk about. Yeah. The bottom of the ocean. But I was, su- I was actually just surprised in general that the crust of the Earth is so thin. Oh, yeah. Compared to, you know, the layers that are underneath it. Yeah, it is weird. You would expect it to be more. Now, to kind of put it into perspective, though, Exxon Neftegas Limited, on August 27th of 2012, drilled the deepest well in the world at a depth of 7.7 miles, 12.4 kilometers, offshore of Sakhalin, which is an island off southeastern Russia. So the deepest that we've ever drilled is only Into the earth is only 7 miles. 7.7 miles. (laughs) Only 7 miles. Only 7 miles. Almost 8 miles. That's crazy. See, I would have thought, like, we could drill like 30 or 50 miles right no yeah and this is just a shaft this isn't even like you couldn't climb down there right so that's that's pretty crazy so that did anything come of that or is that just the biggest oh that's just it was just a mining they didn't they didn't discover anything cool no they discover they discovered all kinds of cool geological things that made zero sense to me yeah talking about different elements they found and how it's just it's a lot of it there's a lot of information yeah well you know you're not a fucking geologist i am not a geologist (laughs) geology is some crazy shit joanna it is it's some of it's very interesting but you know 
I don't think I could actually become a geologist. I couldn't like learn all that. I'm sure you could shit. have given enough time and interest. Well, yeah, but I wouldn't be interested in all of it. I, I'm only interested in like the really cool aspects of like geology. oh, crystals are dope. Yeah, exactly. I don't want to fucking learn about other stuff though. Like, yeah. Just the things that look pretty. Just the things that look pretty and are cool. I've and... got a PhD in pretty geology. <laughs> I totally wish I could like customize some degrees and like just just the surface pretty stuff. Like, can I just get a? That would be nice. I, I guess have you a superficial can. degree in geology. <laughs> you might, you might be able to with the I University thing on iPads and stuff. Right. I feel like that's probably just some way to fucking scam a lot of money out of you, though. I think it's free. It's like, is it? I'm pretty sure. Oh. So hollow earth. There is a belief that the earth is hollow and that there is stuff inside the earth. Stories of civilizations living in a sort of inner world are told all over the planet. However, it wasn't until the late 17th century that people started trying to prove that the earth was hollow using science. Edmund Haley was the first of these and had the idea that the earth had a 500 mile, 800 kilometer thick shell, two inside shells, one inside the other, and an inner core. So if you look at a picture of it, it almost looks like, like it's like a target. If you're looking at it at cross section, yeah. Yes. They call it concentric spheres. So it's sort of like those Russian dolls. Mm, yeah, like the nesting dolls. Except they're not shaped. It's a planet Right, shape. they're not shaped like a doll. It's now like this a, is Edmund Haley. So Edmund Haley is actually the guy they named Haley's Comet after. And he also totally believed that the Earth is hollow. Mm-hmm. So that's... Well, I don't think it would be... Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's hollow, but when you think about it, and actually it's... If it's a lot of different layers, it's not really hollow, is it? Each of the layers has their own atmosphere, magnetic poles, and rotated at separate speeds. And this is known as the concentric sphere model. Since they have their own atmosphere, magnetic poles, and distance between the sphere above it, then yes, it could have life, have at least a place for life to live. Except it just doesn't make any goddamn sense at all how it would have an atmosphere and... If it's high enough up, I mean... I actually, I don't, I don't know how high up our atmosphere goes. Mm -hmm. It's hard to breathe out over ten thousand feet. That needs to be compressed. We learned that because of uh, D. B. Cooper. Right. I'm just saying, like, I feel like the atmosphere isn't something that can, I just that can be like recreated under all this stuff because how does oxygen like penetrate and all this other stuff that is needed to create it how does that get through the fucking earth's crust maybe at a uh, molecular level water gets through rock at molecular levels so that you find it encrusted within the rock not mm -hmm. you can't don't crack the rock open and splash but there is hydrogen in the rock so right. the distance between each layer is, is is the same as a layer is thick so in this model we're talking 500 miles between layers between layers I don't think I could see 500 miles away. Mm -mm. That's a long ways. That is a really long ways. 800 kilometers. Haley believed that the atmospheres glowed and thinness in parts of the outer shell we live on allowed for the atmospheres to seep through and create the aurora borealis. He also allowed for the possibility of these layers to be inhabited. He came up with this idea while trying to figure out an explanation for anomalies in compass readings. If I understand it properly, which I may not, he was trying to figure out magnetic declination. Magnetic declination is the difference between the angle of true north and magnetic north. True north is basically the direction that Polaris, the north star, is in the sky, while magnetic north is the point of the Earth's magnetic field. So is that what a compass would use? Yes, it would use the magnetic. It's pretty near the geographic north pole, mm -hmm. but even the geographic north pole and the magnetic north pole are different. They're just really close, so it doesn't really matter. Back in the day here, people used compasses quite a bit for naval navigation when you've got nothing around you, right? Right. And so standing, understanding these anomalies would allow for more accuracy. Haley's 1692 essay commented on how bullshit all the existing theories were for having these two different poles, and came to the conclusion that deep within the Earth was the culprit. Haley and Sir Isaac Newton were totally homies. Mm hmm. And yeah, Haley like helped that. Newton put out his book, Newton's Principia. In this book, Newton has an estimate of the Earth to Moon mass ratio. It's wrong. 
but he's got this in there. Well, you know, I would be highly surprised if it was right, given that you really didn't have a whole lot of um, technology or equipment at all to These fucking guys help were you making with that. this shit up. These guys were just <laughs> smart motherfuckers. They yeah. weren't, like, learning from other people. I mean, right. they were learning some from other people, but they were coming up with this shit using... They were, like, pioneers yeah, in the it's whole, crazy like, shit. you know science thing when yeah, before, yeah like up to this point this is pretty much when like 90 more than 99 percent of the population is like well god just created it all so like who the fuck cares and it's kind of would be kind of scary for him because you know this time is bad for witches and oh yeah science like and witchcraft i think sir isaac close. newton was like on the fucking hit list but he just happened to not had be somewhere where they friends in high places exactly but i i believe that people did want to fucking burn the shit out of him oh i'm sure they did because he was talking all this heresy Mm -hmm. never mind that it's a lot of it's the fucking truth or at least in the right direction yeah using this ratio the earth to moon mass ratio haley comes to the conclusion that the earth is hollow this theory gave haley his explanation for his four magnetic pole theory in 1683 he had come to the conclusion as a reason for the compass anomalies. And now he has a physical way that there can be multiple poles. So that's great for them. They all know why they, quote-unquote, know why this is going on. Mm -hmm. At the time, it was unknown that Saturn's rings rotated with the planet. Haley said that the reason that the inner spheres of Earth did not bump into the others was that gravity kept them from doing so as Saturn to its rings. His allowance for there being life on each of these layers was that there was life in all of nature and, indeed, on all of the planets. Yeah, except our atmosphere ends in space. It doesn't end with something on top of it. It's crazy that way back in the day here, these guys were entertaining extraterrestrial life. Right, but they probably just, who knows if they actually thought it was extraterrestrial. Well, they said he believed that there was Earth on, or life on all planets. Oh, okay. I thought that he was just only believing there was life within each of the No, he said in all of nature. Layers of Earth. No, he said in all of nature, meaning all of nature, you know, the distant planets that they found believe there was life on because that's part of nature and there must be life in nature. All right. Well, I mean, there's not a whole lot to tell you that there, you know, wouldn't be because you don't really know anything about anything, really. Yeah, anything about anything, like what makes life sustainable and what you need to have and that why wouldn't these planets have that it still seems years you know centuries ahead of his time yeah possibly although not to get too off course on this but when i was researching some of this a lot of the the hollow earth uh theorists believe that pyramids are like markers oh yeah yeah yeah. for like portals into the hollow earth and that for the ancient egyptians and like the mayans to have built these pyramids they had to have had help from aliens basically alien technology to move these huge or technology from bricks. the hollow earth right or from the people within the hollow earth helped them build it or so not whatever. really alien well it's like a super race. i think they think it's like a kind of a it's a superhuman right. race but nevertheless pyramids a lot around a lot more before Sir Isaac Newton. That's true. And Ed, and Edmund Haley. And since so, they do talk about it in the Bible and shit. Right. And that is technology that is crazy, too. Like, so crazy that this whole group of people thinks that they, it was impossible for them to do that. But I don't I don't think that way. Yeah. I mean, clearly, as you can tell, I'm, I'm not a subscriber to the Hollow Earth Theory. So. Right, right. But, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it was way advanced. But also think of some of the things that people did. You know, hundreds and thousands of years before this dude is even alive. Right, right. They just didn't make, they made great advances in, like, architecture and mathematics to, to build those things. But they didn't, like, you know, I guess know a whole lot about, like, space. and. No, no, they did not. <laughs> People throughout time have done some really, like, genius things. Oh, and yeah, I, and definitely. I just don't, I don't know why some people think it's so hard to accept that somebody from so long ago could just be a genius just like the egyptians there there had to have been somebody out there been like yeah this is the design we're gonna go with because i'm fucking smart as shit but that's that's just not recorded who that person was or the recordings are 
long since destroyed. Since right, that's they were a very written old on civilization. yeah, they were written on some parchment or something. Right, or even a piece of stone that ended ended up getting fucked up somehow. Right, like how do you even judge hieroglyphics? How do you know what you are translating is correct? Because they find the same thing written in the language that you languages people know, like ancient Greek. Mm-hmm. So there, that's the Rosetta Stone. Right. That's exactly how they did it. They found it was written in Greek, uh, another language, and another language, and then Egyptian hieroglyphs. And they're like, "Oh shit, here we go." Mm-hmm. But still, I wouldn't. I wouldn't expect it to be one hundred percent accurate in all the interpretations. Maybe it is right there, still written. Maybe dude's Maybe. name is somewhere on a pyramid somewhere. Nobody's just like noticed that yet. Maybe. All right. In the tallest places of the inside layers. There was, he said, a similar substance to that on the sun that would provide light to these hollow earth denizens that they would need to live. This is the shit, he said, that seeped through the cracks and thin parts to make the aurora borealis. He also argued that because of dreg, if both the moon and earth were of similar densities, the earth would quickly leave the moon behind in space. So the earth must be hollow for it to keep its moon. Hmm. That's all stuff that makes sense. I mean, he and we, well, he did the math. I, I see how it makes sense to them. I don't, right. I mean, I just don't see how people they today couldn't, subscribe they couldn't, to that theory. They couldn't penetrate deep into the earth then. We can barely do it now. And uh, so, I mean, that's pretty good. He wasn't dumping religion on it. There's no mystical shit. It was right. all the science of the time. Right. I think that his theory on why. Yeah, it totally makes sense why he thought it was oh, this yeah. way. Yeah, it was all, it's, it's logical. He was thinking very logically, he wasn't, but I think people today that subscribe to the hollow earth theory are maybe not using logic as much, be just because I think, I think science has proven that. As far as we know. As far as we know. I mean, we've, but the Smithsonian I, probably... I, mean, I, have, I, have a, I have a fucking article from the Smithsonian. I have a feeling we're going to be talking about this Smithsonian conspiracy a little bit. I do have an article written uh, for the Smithsonian News about hollow earth theory. Well, good. We'll hear that from you in a little while. <laughs> in the 1730s, we have a debate as to the shape of the earth now. Some believe it is flatter at the poles and wider at the equator. Others believe that it is flatter at the equator and wider at the poles. And some people just believe that the Earth is flat in general. That, Or banana-shaped. Mm-hmm. Nate loves the flat Earth theory, everyone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's my favorite. You know, when I was doing the hollow, when I was doing this research for the hollow Earth, um, I actually came across several uh, web forums where uh, flat Earthers and hollow Earthers were just all, like, at war with each other, wow. basically. Yeah. Flat versus hollow. Mm-hmm. And I mean... And I guess there's, like, a hierarchy in the whole, like, conspiracy theory, uh, in all the conspiracy theory groups, and those that believe in the hollow earth theory are thought to be cooler than those that believe in flat earth, which I oh, get so to an hollow extent. Oh, so hollow earthers are, are, like, the cool kids. Yes. While the flat, er- the well, flat, the flat earthers, earthers are, yeah. like, sitting alone at lunch. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I hate you guys. I see. The earth is flat. I mean, Hollow Earth, I, I mean, I kind of get that. I mean, Hollow Earth, at least you're acknowledging that the world is fucking round, you know, that it's a sphere and stuff. Well, Sir Isaac Newton didn't believe the world was flat. He believed that it was flatter at the poles and wider at the equator, which is... So what would that what would that make the overall shape of Earth be like if you saw it? Sort of... It's like if you had like a an, sphere and you just kind of squished it down a little yeah, bit? Yeah, just a little bit, like a watermelon like a, shaped. Okay, Except not quite as extreme as a watermelon. So if you took a balloon and just squeezed the top and the bottom Mm -hmm. down just a little bit. Well, during this whole debate, we have a man named Lenhart Euler that comes into play. Yes, I have heard. He is an alleged hollow earth believer and a fancy math guy. So this guy was one is considered still the most prolific mathematician of all time. Wow. And he did pioneering work in pretty much all advanced maths the math that is just fucking weird with imaginary numbers probably he was this way old school dude who was doing this crazy shit i can't even like hardly get beyond basic math 
this I mean, guy we was that well already. beyond basic math. I mean, well, you know, we talked about this last episode with, you know, my brother, uh, my youngest brother, actually, his, um, he had a double degree in one of them was in math. Crazy math guy. Yeah, crazy yeah. math guy. It just does, I looked at some of the, just the titles of some of the classes he took. Oh, I'm sure. It was like, huh? Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> so it can be found on the internet that this guy, Euler, was a proponent of hollow earth. However, nowhere could I find any direct quotes or writings from Euler regarding hollow earth at all. Simply people saying he did. So maybe he's just being used, you think? Well, like... the closest that I found to him talking about a hollow earth was in a letter he wrote. In this letter, he, was, he wrote what's called a thought experiment, which is just a hypothetical situation that you think your way through. In this thought experiment, he wondered what would happen if there was a hole going all the way through the earth and you dropped a rock down it, what would happen? Would it fall all the way through? Would it stop in the middle? Would it hit a side? Hmm. So that's that's the only time that he ever is known to personally have said anything about a hollow earth. Maybe and that was like a hypothetical a situation. To me. It's all math. Right, but you know, the, phys- the whole like two objects falling... At the same time, even though one's heavier well, it's than not, the other. Yeah, it has nothing to do with the... I don't it know. Doesn't have any, I, I, all it, I'm really, saying is it doesn't seem like it, that has anything to do with a hollow, like him believing in hollow earth. That's oh, just no. kind of like, that's like, I oh, see what hey, you're saying. Yeah, yeah, that's like a no, physics no, no. question he's just trying to think of. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly what I believe. Mm-hmm. That's what I read it as, too, is yeah. he wasn't seriously saying, look, you guys, there's a hollow earth. Yeah. But... In a book called Lands Beyond by L. Sprague de Camp and Willie Lee, or Lay, not sure how it's pronounced, it is claimed that Euler had actually proposed that there was a sun in the center of the Earth measuring 620 miles across, 998 kilometers, and all the things that lived there lived on the underside of the crust that we live on. So they're walking upside down, basically. Our feet are on the same bit of land. Dude. It's the upside down place. Right? And it's because there's the center like... of gravity inside the crust. So each there's like outside layer and then center of gravity and then another outside layer and then they're standing on that other outside layer. So the center of gravity basically is located within each crust. Exactly. That's what that's what the book Lands Beyond claims that Euler proposed. Hmm. I would still think even even if I was going to subscribe to the theory that there are worlds in between, like all these layers, I would think we'd all be facing the same. Our feet yeah, would all be the same like direction. Yeah, like it would still, yeah, towards the center, towards right? Towards the center. Yeah, that's what I expected too, but not, not what these two authors claimed Euler proposed. Uh, there's also, they claim he proposed that there was also holes at each of the poles. That's a nice rhyme. Say it 20 times fast. I will not. (laughs) Uh, This book didn't actually give any references as to where they got the information. Now, Sir John Leslie wrote a book called Elements of Natural Philosophy, published in 1829. I read the notes at the end, and in these notes, he does a bunch of math that explains in complicated terms why he thinks the Earth is hollow. I read it a few times, and I think that what he is saying is that If the Earth is solid, because of the increased gravity at its center, it would be too dense to exist, or something like that. Interesting. I think more like the opposite, that it would just cave in and fold in on itself if we didn't have a solid. Can you show me the math? Because this guy showed me the math. I cannot show you the math. And this math made no sense. Because I don't know how to do this. It was complicated shit. Yeah, it's really complicated shit, but I do know that uh, space is basically like this hideous crushing gaping void and i feel like in order to be in it it has to be like a solid mass or you're just gonna be like fucking crushed i think that our atmosphere is kind of what keeps that out but i don't know i'm not i don't know about this i'm just our atmosphere does not seem at all thin like thick enough to do something like that well i i don't know i'm not gonna speculate because i don't have any clue (laughs) Uh, whatever proof this guy or proof quote unquote, this guy had, he did in fact plainly believe that the earth was hollow and is filled with light in its most concentrated state. This does not mention any sort of interior sun, just concentrated light, whatever the fuck that is. Concentrated light. And where does that come from? 
the inside of the planet. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, DeCamp and Lay make claims that Leslie took up Euler's idea. So his the, alleged idea. His alleged idea, but changed it to having two sons now, called Pluto and Persephone. This was a hundred years before the now disgraced ex-planet Pluto was discovered. So they decided that now there's two sons in here. I like the name of a son being Persephone. I think that's that's a nice name for a son. Yeah. Not like a son, but like a star son. Mm-hmm. But again, they provide no reference to where they got their information. Right, or how how would that even work? I just well, don't understand the sun and... Now, these works by these guys are taken seriously. It should be mentioned that both L. Sprague de Camp and Willie Lee were science fiction writers, and his book Lands Beyond was not supposed to be nonfiction. This book is an exploration of myths and legends from places all over the world. I obviously couldn't find it but from physically, but from what I've read about it, Lands Beyond is the book version of those Mysteries Revealed or Ancient Stuff Solved type shows, you know? Okay. Or like the clickbait, that sort of thing. It's weird that people take their writings as reality when they're they're not – it's not in the nonfiction section. Right. It's in fiction or, you know, fantasy or whatever the fuck, but mm -hmm. it's not in nonfiction. Right. Well, you know, I mean, there's people that take everything in the Bible to be. But that's well. actually, I, I don't, I mean, that's in religion, and religion is meant to be taken <laughs> as the literal truth. Didn't you know this? Yes, I, I do know this. Lots of people believe it. Although, Although millions there of are. Billions of people believe it. Well, yeah, but I'm just saying, like, it's not so weird to have um, a sect of people believe this to be true. As much as somebody might believe the Bible to be true. Fair enough. I guess the difference is where you find it in the bookstore. Yes. And just maybe what appeals to you as a person and your own personal... What have yous. Yeah, exactly. So moving on to the late 19th century, a man named John Sims was very vocal about his belief in Hollow Earth. He also believed in the concentric sphere model, which is you know, the, the Russian doll model. Yeah, now is he the one who, like, had the whole cult and, like... Not yet. Oh, okay. It's still a little bit early for that guy. Oh, okay. That guy's awesome. Wow, wow you, are been, you have been thorough on this one, haven't you? Yes. <laughs> he also believed in the concentric sphere model and promoted this idea so much that the holes at the poles, I like saying that, that lead into the inner earth have now been called Sims holes. Sims holes. Sims holes. Sims believed that the Earth was made up of five concentric spheres, the one we are living on being the largest and outermost. According to what he believed, the crust we live on is 1,000 miles, 1609 kilometers thick, and the Arctic hole is 4,000 miles, 6,450 kilometers wide. The Antarctic hole is six miles wide, which is 9,650 kilometers. <laughs> Sorry. Antarctic hole, just... <laughs> right? That's the South Hole, Joanna. <laughs> God. In this theory, sunlight would reflect down these holes, so they are the holes where the sun does shine. I guess so. To each of the spheres which allow for animals to live, plants to grow, and possibly even humans. Also, he believed that all of the celestial bodies follow this concentric sphere model, from the sun down to an asteroid. So is this like, kind of like, okay, the, the Earth's crust is like a little bit like Swiss cheese. Is this what's letting it... Go are are these no, holes so only at the polar? The holes, the natural holes, are only at the poles. The Sims holes at the poles. Sims holes. Why would anyone want to name it that? It was the nineteenth century. They weren't thinking buttholes or like any other kinds of holes. They were just thinking a literal hole in the fucking ground. Right, and I must name it after myself because I'm fucking awesome. Right. Or something. I don't know if he named it after himself or people were like Sims talking about his holes. Right. It's your damn Sims holes. Like, it's hard to say. Shut your fucking Sim hole. All right. Well, by the time Sims began his lecture tour about this subject, he had taken it from five concentric spheres down to the one we live on and another beneath. So just two. Oh, so he had adjusted his original theory. He adjusted it, yes. This theory was based on Haley's work. And like De Camp and Lay, he also believed that Euler's ideas proved the Earth to be hollow. Though Sims did say he came up with his Hollow Earth idea independently of Haley and Euler, and was not aware of their publications until later. 
Now, I think that this theory is actually what we would call, or what I would call, the Jules Verne theory. Yes. The two within one. Because, yes. let me tell you, I might not be a believer in Hollow Earth, but Journey to the Center of the Earth, one of my favorite movies, like, since I was a kid, the 1959. Oh, right. Yeah. It wasn't Brendan Fraser in a new one? Yeah, but that one was fucking stupid. Wasn't that the one where they got all fucked up on some plant? I think so. Because that part's they didn't... hilarious. Yeah, but I, I only watched it once, and I was like, oh, this sucks. But the one from 1959, I, like, watched, that's when I watched, like, regularly, you know, like, a couple of times a year. Because oh, yeah. I fucking, like, love the shit out of it. And basically, so anyone who has a, it's it's a book, Jules Verne wrote the book, but then they made a movie about it in 1959. I used to get for Christmas classic novels. They were small in size, probably six by, a little bit smaller than, like, the size of a Blu-ray case. Mm-hmm. And Journey to the Central Center of the Earth was one of the ones that I got. Yeah, so basically there's a professor, a, a science professor, Otto Lindenbrook, um, who gets a piece of lava that comes out of a volcano that it shouldn't have come out of and realizes that this famous scientist had sent it and he had gone into the center of the Earth and sent up this message for anyone who finds it. And the message is to send bold traveler into the crater of Yokul at Snafel, which the shadow of Skataris touches before the Kalins of July, and you will attain the center of the earth. I did it. And the guy's name is Arne Sognesson. So Professor Lindenbrook, along with some awesome likable characters, including an Icelander named Hans, who is super hot. In the movie? In the movie, yes. They descend... In the 19-old movie? 50s movie or whatever? Yeah, in the 1959 movie. We're not going to talk about the other Brennan Fraser one. That was just... That well, probably because it was wasn't, hysterical. It wasn't close to the book, I don't think, as much as no, 1959 no. was. You can't do that anymore because no one's interested in what happened. They just want to <laughs> see like what was actually written. They just want to see what's flashy. Right, right. This one was not one that was made for the Flash. No. So they basically descend into Earth and... They go through, you know, like there's that kind of a deserty part. There's all this like beautiful crystals. They keep going down and down and down when they descend. Then the Snevels Jokul is a, I think, a mountain range in Iceland near Reykjavik that they they go in through. They enter in through there, and they keep descending and they keep descending until finally, at some point, they they get to a giant field of mushrooms. I love that part. We're in the de- they're in the giant mushroom forest, and then they come out of this cave and there's a fucking ocean in there and so they build a raft out of the mushroom stalks because they're like wood and they go on the ocean and once they meet, reach the finally reach the actual center of the earth there's like a huge storm so there's like an atmosphere and a storm and it does one of those huge like cyclone like drain things down and it sucks them down and when they land they are in the lost city of atlantis oh yes I'll be and damned. then yeah <laughs> and they escape because there's a big altar stone Oh, by the way, spoilers, everyone. Right, right. Just in case you haven't seen this movie <laughs> that's over 50 years old. The the the, it, the shaft goes, there's a shaft that goes up of the volcano to where they can escape and get back out the same way he sent the rock up. But it's kind of blocked, so they use dynamite or gunpowder or something to blow it open, cause a huge earthquake with, like, lava coming up. Everything's about to collapse, and they get into the altar stone, and then they're blown out of a volcano back onto the surface of the earth. And there's yes. adventure that ensues the whole time. I'm oh, sure yes. I mean, is, the whole thing is very adventure and I'm awesome. I'm sure the movie is longer than four or five minutes. Right. Yeah. Exactly. But I would say Probably that... Probably awesome claymation dinosaurs. <laughs> there is a di- There are dimetrodons nice. in there. Claymation they ones? are on the beach That's of the ocean within That's the great. center of the Earth. So, But that basically supports, like, you know, one Earth in the center, like, with an ocean and everything. Well, maybe they didn't go deep enough. Maybe there's another one under that. It could be. And... We don't know. That's in the sequel, right? <laughs> exactly. But, no, I, I love that movie, but I just wouldn't really take that to be, like, oh, yeah, that totally must be what happens if you go well, down into Sims the very middle there. <laughs> definitely believed that you could get to that center, that they could get to a, a, another land beneath our own. He was, he actually managed to get it in front of Congress to try and secure funding to mount an expedition. Right, I think this is, what. so what year is this? Oh, this is in the uh, 19th century. 
Yeah, but I and I think that's that relates to my Smithsonian article because one of the presidents was like. I mean, they said no to this guy, so I oh, don't know. okay. No, they didn't. They they didn't give him the funding. They're like, no, man. I read an article from the Smithsonian News, and it does mention Sims' attempts to get funding to go on a trip to the Arctic, and that did not happen. Obviously, no, it did not happen. Congress wouldn't give him the money. Exactly, not so. shocking, really. <laughs> so. John Quincy Adams was our sixth president, and he almost made it happen. But because he was just happened to be um, kind of an unlikable person, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Congress was just like, no. They were just trying to kind of blocking him of whatever he wanted to do just because he was him. Right. Yeah. Right. It was kind of one of those deals because it was weird how he won the – election he was he became president as a result of a the decision of the house of representatives oh weird yeah imagine the softest sheets you've ever felt now imagine them getting even softer over time that's what you'll feel with bowl and branch's best-selling signature sheets and 100 organic cotton in a recent customer survey 96 percent replied that bowl and branch sheets get softer with every wash start getting your best night's sleep in sheets that get softer and softer for years to come try their sheets with a 30 night guarantee plus for a limited time get 20 percent off your first order at bowlandbranch.com code span exclusions apply see site for details quote from the article here it says adams was president as a result of a decision of the house of representatives after an election in 1824 that gave no single candidate a needed majority so he ran against andrew jackson who had more votes but somehow they decided that john quincy adams should be fucking president weird yeah well you know politics politics some uh crazy it's kind of like you know like hey who won the popular vote and then there's the electoral college and right except this was like way back in the day and a little this was a little bit different than popular versus electoral but apparently it didn't go over so well right the government the rest of the government wasn't overly pleased and so they exactly uh, acted as they felt appropriate exactly so he totally also backed the the thought of hollow earth and i think that was part of the reason why he he was interested in in going um, to the arctic because he wanted to look yeah. for the sims hole as well yes exactly and so unfortunately unfortunately no one liked him, so. unfortunately no one liked him and um he only had the single term in office he was a one-termer yep Probably because he was well liked, so yeah. that um, that never happened. That that killed all the initiative for <laughs> for that idea. So that didn't happen. Well, shortly after all of that, we've got a really weird theory of hollow earth. It's known as the inverted or concave or convex hollow earth. This was an idea put forth by Cyrus Teed. Cyrus Teed was an interesting fella. He was born in October of 1839 in New York State. And by age 11, had quit school to help work on the Erie Canal. Different time back then. Definitely. 11-year-olds just fucking... Just fucking quit in school to go get dig. a job to work on the canal. Yeah, I'm sure there was, I don't know, malaria and shit. I'm sure it wasn't very, very awesome. Yeah, do, do a little like shipyard work. and. Yeah, it doesn't... Yeah, no. Mm-mm. So Cyrus's parents pushed for him to become a Baptist minister, but instead he followed in his 25-year-old uncle Samuel's footsteps and began studying medicine. Dr. Samuel Teed lived in practice. He was a doctor at 25. At 25, that's right. Not as much schooling back then, I guess. No, no, not so much. (laughs) He lived and practiced in Utica, New York, and Cyrus moved there to study under him. You could also just teach other people. He also, at this time, married his second cousin. So, you know. There's that. Good on you, Cyrus. <laughs> well, that wasn't a thing back then. No, it wasn't. It just or wasn't... no, it was a thing. It wasn't a bad thing. Well, yeah. It wasn't a thing that anyone batted an eyelash at. No. At all. Not even a little. Nope. In 1860, Cyrus joined the army to fight the Confederacy. 
but after suffering from sunstroke, which left him paralyzed in his left arm and leg, he was discharged from the army, and he returned to Utica in October of 1863. That just sounds like a regular stroke to me. Yeah. It was probably just hot out when it happened, and they are just like, oh, it must have been the sun. Probably, yeah, because <laughs> that seems like... Yeah, when your whole oh. like left side of your body is paralyzed, that's a fucking stroke. Right. No, the sun was out. Yes, it happened during the day. That's Yeah, wonderful. it was really hot that day, but that wasn't it. It was because you know some shit burst in your fucking head and yeah you know he did serve through most of the american civil war so you know that's was probably fucking horrible because he was a mm-hmm. doctor and so he probably was cutting off a lot of people's legs with fucking wood saws and shit oh yeah well the civil war they did more amputations than any other they didn't know yeah. any better and they it was had, basically their cure-all for everything they had the weapons they had were more advanced than their medical mm-hmm man would have been rough it's like any any little thing it was like okay we're just gonna cut your limb off right better than gangrene mm-hmm. it was like yeah just i wonder if that's where you when kids like hurt themselves and like they hurt their arm or their leg and like well we're just gonna have to cut it off yeah it's like when did parents start saying that i, I feel like that was something going Probably. back to the civil war because every little then. injury you got they would just like fucking you know you got shot in the wrist oh we're cutting your fucking arm off splinter oh Yep. Sorry, that finger's got to go. Yep. <laughs> Fuck it. Take the whole hand. You really want to make sure. Right. Yeah. You don't want to be fucking around with that. After returning to Utica, he began studying medicine again, this time at the Eclectic Medical College of the City of New York, which he graduated from in 1868. Eclectic medicine is a medical practice that uses physical therapy and herbal medicine to treat patients. It's said that Cyrus Teed never wrote a patient a prescription for drugs. Now things start to get kind of strange with this guy. Cyrus was into alchemy, and he was also into weirdo experiments, oftentimes involving electricity. Mm -hmm. He claims that he had changed lead into gold, and he called this knowledge the Philosopher's Stone. Oh, I would have called it the Rumpelstiltskin you know something yeah well that's why you aren't naming shit in you know the 1800s <laughs> well okay but yeah it was still about like turning straw into gold well so. this same night he electrocuted the shit out of himself <laughs> and he had a vision in this vision god revealed the nature of the universe which is an inverted hollow earth he also changed his name to koresh koresh being hebrew for cyrus as we learned in yes. the branch davidians episode yes. And he started a commune. Shocker. Unlike later red, unlike later Koresh led communes, this one was actually big on celibacy. So no one was getting none around here. So now we know about the man. Now let's talk about his theory. Teed tells us that we are already living inside a hollow planet, is infinitely far away. Oh, okay. So this is the one where we're on the inside looking Ex- out this, exactly this one kind of fucks well, with we're my on head the a little bit kind of we're like on the outside looking in kind of because we're t- walking on the inside rim so our feet are touching so we're upside outside. down are we yes. upside down in we're this upside one? down if we're in our orientation now we are upside down so but but we're in the inner yes so around this center this that's infinitely far away that's so there's what a right revolves. side up on top of us Yes, underneath us. Underneath us. Well, if we're just, I'll explain the okay. whole thing. Around this center revolves the sun, planets, moons, and everything we observe in the cosmos. This was considered proven by Teed's followers, who did some surveying of the Florida coastline that verified the Earth's curvature as being concave. So concave is the inside of a bowl. Well, we're still talking about so, surveyors back in the 1800s. 1900s, but right. Okay. Uh, now, so we are on the inside of the bowl. If you were cut a ten- if you were to okay, cut the tennis okay. ball in half, we're walking on the inside with our feet on the shell of it. And then all of the inside part of the tennis ball, that's the fucking stars and the moon and the sun and everything. Mhm. So that's what that's what concave is. I still have trouble picturing it in my head. Concave is the inside of a bowl. Yeah, Convex so, okay, so, is the outside of the bowl. Okay. Concave, we're walking inside the bowl. Our so feet we are, are inside the bowl. We are walking inside the bowl. Correct. There is, of course, other proof that this is the way the, of the universe. Old maps and some slightly newer maps 
have latitude and longitude lines curving the opposite way that we normally see today. The reason that we use those types of maps in the modern era is that it shows the true shape, size, and relation to one another of most land masses, mm -hmm. but only in the case that the land masses are on the middle latitudes. It doesn't really work if you're trying to go north or way south, but it works for... Right, because north and south is curved. That's going to be way longitude. off. It'll yeah. be all it'll be all off, yeah. Balloonists, I prefer the term balloonier, but I just made it up so it doesn't actually exist. So like hot air balloonists in the 1800s remarked that from a mile or two up from the earth, it looked like the inside of an upright bowl as opposed to the outside of an upside down bowl. I believe that this was probably just an optical illusion because, mm -hmm. you know, I've been in an airplane before. Right. And it doesn't look like I'm looking down. It doesn't look like you're looking down on a sphere. Yeah, but it doesn't also doesn't look like you're looking down on a bowl. Mm -mm. It doesn't look like it just looks, you know. Yeah. I hate to say it, but it looks flat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're one of those, are you? <laughs> Only from an airplane. Uh, I believe like the images from space of Earth where it's fucking round. Yeah. So. Well, at the beginning of the 20th century, some experiments were conducted at an old mine called the Tamarack Mine. Different kinds of materials were hung down the mine shafts on lines to see if they moved closer together towards the center of the Earth, where the center of gravity would be if the planet was a sphere and we were on the outside of it and it was solid. What it would look like is the weights would get closer at the bottom than at the top, right? Because mm -hmm. it's pulling towards the center. Instead, the weights were farther apart at the bottom than at the top, which they believed indicated that we were on the inside of a bowl. Mm-hmm. So did, he didn't think then that there were layers to Earth, like that kind of hollow Earth, but it was hollow Earth because we're like a bowl. Yes, basically. Okay. Well, exactly, yes. That's this inverted hollow Earth theory. Mm -hmm. And that since the center is infinitely far away, it's not small. Right. It's infinitely large because okay. the center is infinitely far away, so... Did they invent some sort of weird thing to like... Oh, yeah, we're getting there. Okay. Yeah. So depending on the shaft they used in these Tamarack mines depended upon the difference between the top and bottom measurements. Now, they found that these results were probably tainted because of the fact that near the bottom of mine shafts, they were connected by where there was like gas and air flowing. So that could taint the effects. Also, this is a weird thing that I didn't know, but the effect of an object falling down a shaft is unknown. Like, they don't have the actual physics or whatever behind what occurs when this happens. Usually, when a mine worker drops a tool, it will not fall to the bottom of the shaft, but will get stuck a few hundred feet down. And it always is stuck on, I believe, the east side. So, so it's almost weird. like something pulls it? Right. Okay. That is weird. Even people attempting to drop things like marbles right down the center of the shaft, never at the bottom, always lodged in a wall. So it's not just because they're accidentally knocking into a wrench or whatever and it's just falling just on the side and so it obviously gets stuck. It's They take the marble and put it in the center of the hole and drop it lodged on, again, I believe the east side. Well, I think that's just like the Earth's core, like pulling shit. It's hard to say. They don't have the physics for it, so no one really knows. Right. This may or may not have had an effect on the things dangled down the shafts. So... This isn't the most hard bit of evidence here. Well, maybe that's why that guy, what was that guy, Euler? Yes. Maybe that's why that guy was even, you know, Mr. Genius Euler was even uh, thinking this thought is because maybe he was wondering what would happen if there was a hole through the middle of the earth and you drop something down. Yeah. Maybe not so much. Would it come out the other side, but would it be stuck to the side? At what point would it stick to the side? Yeah, that could have been, yeah. I can see the thought behind that. Definitely, especially because mining was probably a lot bigger of a deal then. Mm -hmm. Although, I don't know, mining was actually, no, I'm sure that's not the case. That, well, mining's like day, always been a thing. But, I mean, not going that deep. Well, yeah, because you didn't have like the, you just didn't have the technology to dig. Oh, no. To dig. No. Seven that miles, super deep. eight miles. Right. But maybe that Euler guy had an idea of what might happen. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. He was a smart motherfucker. Mm-hmm. So some people have also used a laser to test the curvature of the Earth. 
place a stake with a laser at one height and another stake with a target at the same height as the laser some distance away. So they're both set on a three, like a target at three feet above the ground and you go a ways away and put another target three feet off the ground. Depending upon concave, convex, or flat, the laser should be higher, lower, or spot on respectively to the target. Lasers, however, diffuse at distance and environmental variations may come into play as well. So the Koreshians, as they're called, they come up with the rectilineator. It's a device that was conceived... That sounds really bad. It does. <laughs> uh, they conceived this and, and used it. They, they came up with this thing. So it's a series of 12 foot long by 8 inch thick mahogany beams, which is uh -oh. 3.6 meters long by 20.3 centimeters thick. And they're supported by two vertical posts with brass castings that allow for height adjustments. Going in X shape across the mahogany beams were steel tension bars. What they did was for about a 4.5 mile stretch of beach, which is 7.2 kilometers, in Florida, they set this shit up in a line. So they would excavate a path to keep the ground level and found that the longer they went, the more they had to adjust the bars to be higher, which is indicating that we are on the inside of a bowl, right? Mm -hmm. The result remained consistent with the results they expected on a concave earth, but the device isn't very accurate. They did backtrack their tests and the results were consistent. Uh, skeptics were just sort of, oh, the beams are sagging, but mahogany is a hard wood. And it is. That's it a lasts big, for a really long time. And that's a big, thick bit of it. So sagging? Unlikely. I don't know. Everything sags eventually. Eventually. Gravity's cruel. But not for the <laughs> length of time it takes you to put these things up 4.5 miles. Right. I just, I don't know. However, the sand could shift that's likely i mean those are i'm sure were fucking heavy and how far can you even go out on a beach before you're hitting water even in Florida? well i believe they're going across on the okay so I mean, they're, I going, which... they're going down the beach but that doesn't mean right. that there's not weird height differences i know and... i know that's why it's not really very accurate now there was another rectilineator test done in 2016 <laughs> every time you say that word it just i had to yeah. practice saying that word <laughs> uh, as far as I can tell, there were some setbacks, and they quickly discontinued the test, and then pronounced the original one di done by Koresh's followers a fraud. So these guys, it was, yeah, it was kind of, it wasn't overly impressive. It started to rain or something, and they stopped, and they couldn't get the funding together or something, or, I All don't know, about it, was, the funding. it was something. So there's one more theory of Hollow Earth. And this is the most recently developed theory, and it's called the Complete Shell Hollow Earth Model. Now, this is based on a combination of hollow earth theories and expanding earth theories. Have you heard of expanding earth theory? I have not heard of expanding earth theory. Expanding earth theory is basically that the continental drift is a result of the earth actually getting bigger. So instead of when we were in pa when the continents were all Pangaea, instead mm -hmm. of them floating away i know they're not actually floating but right instead of them floating away the earth is moving and they're remaining in place i say they more like broke away from each other exactly it was like a because of all the earthquake like all the tectonic shifts. well because yeah but in, and instead of it just shifting like a rubik's cube it actually mm -hmm. used all of that matter that is made to fill in between the tectonic plates to get bigger and bigger so it's like the Earth is being pulled apart, basically? Yes, it's expanding. It's like blowing up a balloon. Mm -hmm. If you draw something on a balloon, like a picture on a balloon, yeah, then as it gets bigger, the picture is going to stretch and right. deform and stuff, and that's what the continents but did. But what is pulling the Earth apart? Is it like space? No, it's from the inside. From the inside, it's, it's growing. Yes. So back in the day when the Earth was smaller, it rotated much faster, and this reduced gravity in areas near the equator which is what allowed for critters to be so huge millions of years ago. Each shell has its own center of gravity between its upper and lower crust. The main proof for this type of hollow earth comes from the nature of craters created from shit falling from space. Hmm. They classify them into three different kinds. They got really creative here, and they call them small, medium, and large craters. Where do you think they came up with that? 
snappy AI like naming system. <laughs> There's a size range for each, but it's not overly important. Small craters aren't super deep and look like a bowl when the edge with the edge is higher than the ground around it due to the debris. So just drop a golf ball in the snow. Mm-hmm. And that's what a small crater looks like. A medium crater looks similar, but instead of the smooth bowl shape, in the center is a mound. Think of when you drop a rock into water. Initially, the water splashes around the rock, but when it goes under, there's a small upward geyser in the center where the rock hits. That's what these medium craters look like. Large craters are similar to the small one, except the inside of the bowl tends to follow the outside curvature of the planet. So it's like a bowl with the debris field around it with another upside-down bowl inside of it. Okay, that's weird. It is weird. So instead of being... uh, The reason for the large craters to look this way, in this theory, is the interplanetary wall is pulled back out to its original curvature very swiftly due to the center of gravity. Sort of like when you poke a balloon with your finger. While your finger is against the balloon, it's concave. But as soon as you remove your finger, it regains its curvature. Medium craters have that center mound because of the rapid rebound, just like the rock in the water. And the small craters, they're just... They're not even hitting this interplanetary wall. Now, this data was gathered mainly from observations of Mercury and the moon. Oh, really? So not real anything on Earth, I guess. Or maybe there's just not enough craters on Earth for them to... So basically, it's people taking information that actual astronauts and scientists have gathered about other planets and using it to make up some bullshit about our own? Yes, more or less. (laughs) <laughs> saying that since they're in the same cosmos, those planets must be similar to ours. Except that all the planets are kind of different, so. Yes, they are different in many ways. Mm-hmm. Many, many ways. Like, I mean, we're the only one that has the right combination to sustain life. That we're aware of. That we are aware of. I mean, there's tons of shit out there, but. There is tons of shit out there. And I fully believe that there is tons of shit out there, but I just do not believe that. The Earth is hollow. That's it's okay. (laughs) As long as you don't believe it's flat, we're fine. (laughs) So we're going to talk a bit about some of the mythology that people draw from. To right now, this is where it gets like super fucking weird. This is going to be sort of rambling because it's just sort of the nature of all these different things. What is the place called? Is it like Agatha? Agartha. Agartha. Well, there's a lot of different names for it. We'll get to that one. The Agartha one is the one where I'm just like, oh my god. That one is, yeah, there's a lot of different stories about that one. But first off, so each of the discussed theories have only briefly mentioned what is actually inside the Earth. And then only pretty much the landscape. Not much talk about what may inhabit the inside of our planet. Obviously, with the concave hollow Earth theory, we are what's inside the Earth. But other theories assume we live on the outermost layer of the planet. Myths and legends tell of distant ancestors that came from underground, and many talk of cities and civilizations that exist beneath our feet. Many religions throughout the ages, including some of those today, speak of a place where the dead go that is referred to as being down below. Oftentimes, the civilizations that are supposed to live inside the planet are more advanced than us, both technologically and spiritually. UFOs are believed to come from some of these subterranean neighbors as well. And then uh, Nazis... uh... Oh, we'll get you to the know. Nazis. Don't you worry. <laughs> Don't you worry about the Nazis. It's like, why does everything on? weird have to like involve Nazis? Because somehow? the Nazis were the super fucking weird, <laughs> man. It's like you're talking about something completely fucking weird and random, and then it's like, oh yeah, like Hitler had a fucking special group assigned to investigate this shit. It's like, are you kidding me? Maybe yeah. it's just because they were so secret and it just sparks people's imaginations and they just want to draw Nazis into all of it. Right. Well, I mean, they are, like, the quintessential bad guy, too. They are definitely bad guys. They are effective in what they did, but they are definitely bad guys. Fucking terrible bad guys. What was, is that, was that Operation Krill? Is that what that one was called? What? With the the Nazis. Which one with the Nazis? The Hollow Earth with the Nazis. Oh, I don't, uh, yeah, I believe Operation Vril was it, Vril, okay. Because Vril was some ancient something i actually don't have a whole lot on vril itself but i do talk about the we do we will be talking about the thule society okay but back in ancient greece there are stories of that speak of tunnels that can lead you to the underworld 
The Celts spoke of subterranean land where the Tuatha de Danon had come from and returned to. What are the Tuatha de Danon? Uh, they were a type of, like, the gods, basically. Mm -hmm. Taught the Irish people how to do stuff, build, plant, that sort of thing. There was I talk of giants, them. actually, being yep, from the... Giants. I, You know, when I'm listening to some of these ones that were just so, like, oh, my God. Robot voices. Robot voices. And are we even talking about anything remotely connected to reality at this point? They were talking about... The blonde hair, blue eyed giants. I remember, yeah. like, I was like, "Oh, what?" <laughs> I remember, I remember hearing about those. So, ancient Indian tribes claimed that their ancestors came from underground land. The original inhabitants of Cuba, the Taino, believed that in ancient times their ancestors had come from a mountain underground. Ancient German myths speak of a portal to inner earth. Russian legends speak of an ancient tribe that traveled to an underground city and moved in. Brazilian natives and Incas both spoke of ancestors coming from an underground country. People of the Andes believed in an inner earth with vast cities and beings living there different from those living on the earth's crust. You know what I always think of when I think of hollow earth, um, besides journey to the center of the earth, for some reason it makes me think of the Hobbit. Oh, well, yeah, he goes like it seems like, mountain. Yeah, well, yeah, he goes in the mountain, but it seems like if there was like another earth below us, it would be like the Shire. Right. There'd be like hobbits there Maybe. and like little hobbit houses. And I don't know why. Well, hobbit, you know what a hobbit homes mean? They mean comfort. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And if you were to go in there, like that's, that's what it would be. It would be like a bunch of hobbits and their little, you know, smoking weed wood, and ho yeah, houses. And... Yeah. <laughs> Even in the Bible, there are references to under the earth as an actual realm like earth and heaven. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth. Philippians 2.10 And of course, we have to consult the book of Enoch. And sure as shit, it talks about angels taking Enoch to a land in the middle of the earth. Right there in chapter 26 of the book of the Watchers. There are many passages that talk about under the earth and in the earth. In Job, God asks Satan where he's been. And Satan tells him he's been on earth and in earth. Job 1.7 specifically. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and from in the earth and from walking up and down in it. According well, to some... I was going to say that makes sense because hell is a place that people believe in a lot too. That's in the earth. That is going uh, down yeah, below. Right? You're going down to hell. Yep, yep. There are, in fact, like how many layers of hell are there? Seven layers of hell? Oh, man. It's hard to say. Nine? Mm -hmm. Seven? Something oh, like wait, that. No, but... wait, wait, hold on. Probably six because man is five, God is six. Oh, no, man is five, the devil is six, and God is seven. All right. I think. Something like that. Something like that. They they use that theory with the pyramids, too. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah that didn't surprise it's, me. It's really weird, but, but yeah, I mean, like, I can totally see it. Like, oh, hell is under the earth. A lot of medieval paintings, you see people being pulled down. Yes, definitely. By Satan under the earth to hell into basically. a hollow yeah. earth there's actually supposed to be a place uh, where the watchers so the watchers would be the ones that fucked all the earth women and made the weird giants and shit mm -hmm. and all the other wacky things and they must have done something else too because they, I mean, they're called got, the watchers I they mean. got in trouble god got pissed at them and he put them in a place beneath hell called mm -hmm. tartarus so they're even deeper in hell. Like, they're so deep that they're underneath hell. Right. So that's, you know, shitty for them. Yeah, they're even below hell. That's crazy. According to some interpretations of scripture, there are all kinds of supernatural evil things in a hollow earth. The book of Revelations talks about insect things coming out of a crack in the earth. They are said to look like horse-sized locusts with the faces of men. Something like crowns of gold on their heads. So helmets, maybe? Golden mm. helmets? Hair of women, long, I'm assuming. Teeth of lion, so fucking sharp. Like fangs. Yeah. Their thorax, which is the middle section, was like a breastplate of iron, and their wings were very loud. So maybe some kind of exoskeletal flying suit. I guess so. It sounds pretty terrifying in a way. It doesn't sound cool. Yeah, I wouldn't want to run into that. They also had tails that had stingers that would injure people for five months. Very specific. It said wow. five, five months. months. Yes. Exactly. Their boss is a guy, the Angel of the Abyss, Abaddon, 
His Greek name is Apollyon. And they were very insistent on that for some reason. It says in the Bible, his name is Abaddon, and his Greek in Greek they call him Apollyon or whatever. So, just, just kind of want to make it clear. He's just a drama queen, right? These passages and inferences lead some people to believe that Satan has some kind of gig going on in Hollow Earth. Much of the proof for Hollow Earth they're pulling from the Bible seems like a bit of a stretch, however. Right, and if and Satan read, does have a gig going on in Hollow Earth, that would be hell. It and like to me, like I read a bunch of different translations of some of these. And it's just certain translations that throw in coming out of a crack from the planet or things like that. So mm -hmm. it's also in maybe wrong translations or it could be this. And so we're going to use this because it furthers our agenda or whatever. I don't know. Well, and I mean, you think about this shit happening at the time. Like, you know, cracks in the earth are bad. They are. Nothing good comes of it. That's for sure. Pretty much just like stories of giants and floods. Stories of realm inside the Earth are told worldwide. Do you think volcanic eruptions had anything to do with those thoughts too? It's hard to the say. Earth rumbles. I mean, fucking the, lava spews out from it. It's hard to say because there was no word, at least as far as the Romans were concerned, they had no word for volcano until Pompeii mm -hmm. because they had which not fucking sucked for a lot of people. Yeah, so they hadn't, which means they hadn't witnessed one. So. Maybe it was something that happened so infrequently for these people that they had no other word but act of God sort of deal. Right. Yeah. So probably the most influential idea in legend uses proof of hollow earth is the story of Shambhala. Though the first time the story was recorded was in 966 CE India, for some reason it is known as a, Tib a Tibetan myth. Maybe it was just told in Tibet and it was just first written down in India. Basically, what it means is that there is a land beneath the Himalayas that's ruled by a super cool king. He's all spiritual and Buddhist, and this land is called Shambhala. Accounts say that it is a valley circled by snowy mountain peaks. There's a lake and a very nice palace in the mountain. It's supposed to be a paradise or utopia, so everyone has time to think about stuff, and they get all, they're all super wise, and according to legend, they're going to save the world, Joanna. Really? It's said that Shambhala gets a total of 32 kings that will rule for 100 years each. Everything outside of Shambhala will slowly go to shit. Wars will happen. Materialism will be revered over spirituality. Finally, a tyrant will rule the world and everything will be shittier than it has ever been. When this supreme shittiness happens, Shambhala will be revealed and the last king will Rudra Kakrin will lead an army of good to triumph against tyranny and everything will be fine. This story differs slightly in Kalachakra Buddhism, which is the complex and esoteric practice of Tibetan Buddhism. They're like the motherfuckers doing topo work. Not <laughs> like the bronies doing topo work, but like, you know, the crazy superhero topo shit. Right, the cool topo sh stuff as opposed to the, you know, sad, friendless... Plopping. Plopping, oh my god. According to them, a future Buddha rules Shambhala, and the 25th king will lead an army against the bad guys and win. Scholars actually put this at 2424 CE, so even in our future. How cool is that? The origin of Shambhala is said to have been from a king who expelled 20,000 of his subjects from his domain over religious reasons. They didn't want to convert to Kalachakra Buddhism. The king eventually realized that they were the smartest of his people, and he wanted them back. So he asked them to return. Some did, others didn't. The ones who didn't are said to have built Shambhala. Shambhala is also, it was it written about Shangri-Li. Yeah, it was written about in some book. Uh, it was a fictional book, but it is based on uh, Shambhala. Yet another telling of this legend talks about a tribe entering the caves beneath the Himalayas to escape marauding warriors, and then they just stayed, starting a subterranean civilization. Imagine what's possible when learning doesn't get in the way of life. At Capella University, our game-changing FlexPath learning format lets you set your own deadline so you can learn at a time and pace that works for you. It's an education you can tailor to your schedule. That means you don't have to put your life on hold to pursue your professional goals. Instead, enjoy learning your way and earn your degree without missing a beat. A different future is closer than you think with Capella University. Learn more at capella.edu.
Despite what many people infer, I didn't find anything in Tibetan myth and legend that specifically talked about a hollow planet. Another story of Shambhala, recounted in ancient texts of some sort, talk about a people called the Shangsheng, who lived in north and northwestern Tibet. These people are known about in modern archaeology and are, and are estimated to have been around from 500 BCE to 625 CE, and are thought to follow a religion that is, or is similar to, Bon. We talked briefly about the Bon religion in our Talpa episode. It's thought to be either a religion predating Buddhism or an offshoot of Tibetan Buddhism. If the Shangsheng did follow the Bon religion, then it definitely predates Buddhism, but that's not really the point. Uh, these ancient texts say that Shambhala was located in a part of this culture's civilization. In 1912, a Russian man named Nicholas Rourke learned of Shambhala from a Buddhist lama who had visited St. Petersburg. How weird is that, that you just... It's 1912, you don't just learn about stuff until some foreigner comes and tells you about it. Right. Just, And I wonder how many Buddhists were rolling around... St. Petersburg. I mean, I guess the Tibetan kind are used to the cold, at least. Well, yeah, and uh, St. Petersburg, Russia, right? Yeah. So, you know, Russia and Asia are... I guess it is pretty yeah. close, really. Mm -hmm. I guess that's probably one of the biggest cities to go to. It's always something that that kind of weirds me out, like, because there's Russia, it's Siberia, and then it's, like, Asia. Yeah, because Russia is considered Western. Mm -hmm. They were part of Western Christianity and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff, but it seems... So Eastern. Well, in 1924, this guy and his wife decided to take a tour of Central Asia. So during this time, it was a hell of a task. Because you were on foot or you were on an animal, like a donkey or something. And this couple was over 50 years old. Probably been smoking their whole life. And they're just going to go wander through the Central, Central Asia. He was a painter, amongst other things and wanted to be the first Westerner to paint the mountain ranges of Central Asia, Tibet, and India. Additionally, it's believed he wanted to find Shambhala. His information from the Tibetan holy books Kanjur and Tanjur claim that the hidden kingdom is located north of the Buddhist shrine in India, Bodh Gaya. At the monastery of Lamayuru Hemis in northern India, he was told that Shambhala was the capital of a country called Agarti, which is where the king of the world lived. King of the world, huh? Yep. He had also learned from talking to lamas that there were several ways to get into this hidden land by taking underground passageways. Interesting. So Agarthi is one of the names for Agartha. I see. I was wondering if that was going to tie together at some point. Apparently, throughout the world, there are ways to get into the subterranean land of Agartha. Agarthi, throw those few letters together in any sort of shape and it's basically talking about this place here so this is the one where the pyramids are one of the entrances the pyramids are some of the entrances the great pyramid i believe specifically which is the one the pyramid of giza yes some other notable places are the himalayan mountains which are sit above the city of shanxi it's guarded by hindu monks under the borders between mongolia and china sits a city called xinhua beneath the modern city of rama india it's a lost underground city of the same name. Oh, really? And Mount Shasta, California, is where the city of Telos sits beneath. Interesting. And actually into the mountain, it's said. Interesting. Yes. I also heard that the the my, the temples in Chichen Itza were also Oh, there was one of tons. Them. I only choose, chose a few because I didn't want to list a thousand things. Right. Because there was a, not a thousand, but there was probably like 12 different entrances. And the pyramids were one. And yeah. And just all kinds of places that I probably should have recognized and didn't well that's okay i just know the chichen itza because i was there I oh yeah about that yeah yeah we did my cryptids and yes yes that, yes in the warmth mm -hmm. oh it's so much better than how it is now oh my god an alleged biography of a norwegian sailor named olaf johnson published in 1908 by willis george emerson called the smoky god in 1908 a guy named willis george emerson writes an alleged biography of a Norwegian sailor named Olaf Jansen. Was Olaf a snowman? No, he wasn't. He was just a Norwegian gentleman. <laughs> so I guess he was a man that lived in the snow. Right. So a little bit. This book was called The Smoky God, and it tells the story of Olaf and his father on their ship and it entering into Hollow Earth at the north entrance on accident. Eventually, the sea turns into a river that they later learned was called Hidekel, 
which is the name of the third river flowing out of the Garden of Eden. I believe that's the one that is supposed to go towards Assyria. Olaf and his father ended up living with the people there, who are 12 feet tall, for two years. Giants. They learned their language, which they said was similar to Sanskrit, and it turns out the capital city of this civilization was the original Garden of Eden. Additionally, they learned that these folks worshipped Jehovah, the, you know, Jewish Mm -hmm. god. They ended up leaving through the South Pole, but the ship was destroyed by an iceberg, killing his father in the process. Olaf was rescued, but upon telling his story, was jailed for insanity. In this account, the land they traveled to is not named, but other writings about Agartha suggest that's where Jansen ended up going to. Mm-hmm, I see. Or maybe he was just fucking insane. Killed his father and right. came up with some crazy story, but he was gone mm-hmm. for fucking, you know, two years. So, and he comes out of the South Pole. It's weird, yeah. Super weird. I'll give you that, but... It was written about in the early 1900s, so... It's gotta be the truth, you know? <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> Their vetting process back then was second to none. Some sources say that Agartha is inside the Earth to protect itself from the ancient advanced cultures of Atlantis and Lemuria who were entrenched in a thermonuclear war for quite some time that not only dis- resulted in the destruction of those two lands, but also created such deserts as the Gobi, Sahara, the Australian outback, and much of the southwestern United States. So the thermonuclear war has actually already happened. Between Atlantis and Lemuria. Mm-hmm. Lemuria, yeah. The people of, Ag- of Agartha created these underground cities to escape the destruction caused by this horrific war and to safeguard technology and knowledge. Oh, I see. There are also stories of Agartha in Buddhism. It is said that a holy man led a tribe underground who became the first inhabitants of Agartha. Those who lived in Agartha advanced scientifically and spiritually, and it was suggested that they are now a race of super people. There are millions of inhabitants and a bunch of cities. Also, the king of Agartha gives orders to his surface world representative, the Dalai Lama of Tibet. Oh, so his surface world representative is the Dalai Lama is the Dalai Lama who's also part Tulpa remember right and these orders are transmitted through secret tunnels beneath Tibet I see you know the problem with that is is that if that shit actually existed like more people would know about it it would be on like you know 10 places you have to see before you die Facebook article at this point and like a a bunch of fucking tourists would already be like going there because we'd like the next cool place to go to unless the information is being suppressed i mean i've seen it reported that nasa unnamed nasa people have photoshopped the holes out of the top of the planet oh really yes this must be like the unnamed employees of the smithsonian who probably have, um probably gotten rid of the skeletons of giants i'm they're probably like that was their first job was at the smithsonian right it's like no dude i'm really good at my job i started at the smithsonian i've been there for years i know how to cover up shit right right i know how to suppress the truth you know what's interesting um about the smithsonian uh, that article i was reading off of earlier that was the smithsonian news article well it also happens to and I was talking about John Adams. Well, John Quincy Adams. Yes. John Quincy Adams actually had a hand in the creation of the Smithsonian. So he wasn't able to get funding to, you know, go on a little excursion to the uh, North Pole, South Pole, slash center of the earth, possibly. But he did have a, a huge hand in, in actually making the Smithsonian Institute a thing. And how that came about is there was a gentleman named James Smithson who had quite a bit of money, and he lived over in England. And apparently in his will, it said that if he died without an heir, he wanted all of his money to come to the United States and start a institution called the Smithsonian Institution. So the wording, the exact wording is that to the United States of America... Uh, to found at Washington under the name of Smithsonian Institution an establishment for the increase and diffusion of knowledge. Not the suppression of 
giant bones. Not the suppression of giant bones, but for the increase and diffusion of knowledge. He actually did have a nephew, so it didn't go to the United States at first. It did go to his nephew, but then once his nephew died, then... How did his nephew die? It doesn't say. I don't know. What was his nephew's name? I don't know what his nephew's name was. Just that he died without an heir, and so then the will... I don't know how John Quincy Adams or how that came about that he knew about it, but he was he was president at the time, I believe, and put it through. Had him fall back on the original will so that the United States got the money and him as president right, didn't right, need to go because... through Congress because he had the money there. So that's how he started it, and Congress couldn't tell him to go eat a dick or whatever. Right, because, I mean, this is like a dude's will, and the person that it did go to next didn't have any issue or errors, so... It seems like pretty cut and dry that they should follow the the wishes of James Smith then. And so I wonder he's probably turning over in his grave now, knowing that it's just into suppression these days. <laughs> right, right. I think it more he would be more turning over in his grave, knowing how many people are trying to say that the Smithsonian Institute are suppression are are suppressors of truth. Both James Smith, Smithson and John Adams, because um, Adams really did have a huge uh, passion for nature. There was a lot of nature in America then. Sixth president? Holy shit. There was quite a bit of nature. Vast yes. nature. Which pres- How many presidents, though, until Teddy Roosevelt? Because, I mean, when you think about somebody who's really loved nature. Oh, yeah. He was all about nature. He was all about it. He was all about... Founding the national parks and yeah. a whole lot. But I don't think... Killing I'm, shit. <laughs> like, he wasn't even 100 years after John Quincy Adams. I don't think so. It was the early 1900s. Yeah, and, like, John Quincy Adams was, like, 18, late 1820s. We haven't been a country that long. Right. I mean, we're on... We're on so... I mean, that's, that's... So think about how much more developed it was by the time Teddy Roosevelt yeah. became president. So much so that he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We got to, like, preserve some of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of people, we have the whole United States, all the continental United States anyway at that point. Right. Well, and just think about, like, 1820 to, like, n- I think 1904 is when um, yeah. old Teddy Roosevelt came and became president. But we conquered the West during that time. Yep. Industrialization. Mm-hmm. We had vehicles now, trains. Yeah. We had been building trains all across the country. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty crazy it's how, pretty how crazy. quickly it grew between those times but yeah this article written by the smithsonian is about hollow earth and those who had believed it along the way was definitely in the tone of that smithsonian does not subscribe to the hollow earth theory yes yes which i would agree with them like i agree with most things i'm a fan of the smithsonian well stories of agartha first pop up in publication in the 19th century by Alexandre Saint Yves Delvendry. Sorry, French people. This guy claims that this knowledge was revealed to him via telepathy from some folks in Agartha. They tell him that an ancient Senarchist world government has been transferred to Agartha around 3200 BCE for some reason. Maybe that was the time of the war between Atlantis and Lemuria? I don't know. Synarchism is the idea that social classes and hierarchy should have distinction but with collaboration between all of the classes that is above all conflicts between the classes. So basically, you know, know your place and you'll get a word and things, but it's always got to be fair. You can't hold grudges. Hmm. It's weird. It is weird. That was its original philosophy, I guess. Now it's oftentimes used to describe a hidden power controlling the government or the government actually being that hidden power, so like a shadow government sort of thing. Okay. He believed that once all of Christianity was living as the Bible says, Agartha will be accessible to all, along with its wisdom and wealth. Jesus fucking Christ, I should have known that. Yes. Now, his writings are some that the Thule Society were influenced by, but we'll, we have a little while before <laughs> we get to the Thule Society. First, like eventually, it always comes down to like, oh yeah, 
and it's, the Nazis. It's just about, well, that, you know, you got to follow the Bible. Oh, right. The Bible yeah. is right, everyone. Yes. All along. I mean, yes. it's the same thing with fucking giants. Yes. Yes. Okay, the Bible is right all along. That is the answer to everything. And then, um, you know, Nazis are fucking bad people. Yes. Well, before we talk about Nazis, we're going to talk about the Hopi tribe, which is a Native American tribe. Yes, I know. They, they are, are supposed you. to be their most, the, like, very, very <laughs> spiritual and, like, mystical. Like Now, what area of America? Arizona. 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 Okay, yeah. So, yeah, Native American like the tribe. Four corner, like the Four Corners area? Kind of around there. Okay. Well, I was just saying in general what area for those listeners out there oh, who yes. are not yes. from America. Yes, so that'd be right in, what is that, northwestern Arizona by the Grand Canyon. And in general, yeah, it's southwestern America. Yes, southwestern America. The desert that was created by the thermonuclear war between Lemuria and Atlantis. According to Hopi tradition, this is the fourth world humans have inhabited. It's kind of strange that they landed on four, as the accepted science says we live on the fourth layer of the earth, the crust. The third world was a fucking shithole, all wicked and evil. The ancestors, known as the ancestral Puebloans, got out in one of two ways. The most popular is that the spider grandmother caused a bamboo shoot to grow into the sky, and it emerged into this world. The place that it pierced is the Grand Canyon, and is called Sapapu, a word used by many Native American tribes to call their place of emergence from an inner realm. This Apapu is located at the confluence of the Colorado and Little Colorado Rivers. That's where one flows into the other. They have weird words for water things, mm -hmm. like tributaries and confluences and all this kind of weird stuff. It's a seven-hour hike along the Salt Trail Canyon. It's a 20 to 25-foot, 68-meter high salt mound topped by a hot spring that is believed by some to be a geyser. The other version is that the world was flooded and that the spider grandmother sealed the righteous in reeds that acted as rafts. The spider grandmother. The spider that grandmother. That sounds creepy as fuck. I don't I want know. a spider grandmother. But she's super nice. She's saving all these people. Right, I guess. <laughs> they eventually found land and follow a series of islands eventually emerging on the mountain coasts of this fourth world. In this version, the Supapu is considered to be only a symbol. Unlike from the first and second world, the voyage to the fourth world was a sea voyage, thusly no point of emergence. Once on this fourth world, they migrated throughout it as commanded by Masa, a deity that had gotten a bit too big for his britches in the third world and was getting a second chance not to be a dick here on the fourth. He had these survivors split into clans and gave each clan some sacred tablets. Along with the stars, these tablets were meant to guide them during their migration. Each clan was given a magic water-creating jar, complete with instructions on how to make a new one in case the original one gets broken. This idea of the migration paired with the magic water jar is an ex explanation as to how there are so many ancestral Puebloan settlements in seemingly inhospitable places abandoned about a hundred years or less after habitation. As opposed to the archaeological idea of moving on because of drought. Right, which I think is probably the more likely scenario. Probably, because it is, you know, <laughs> the desert. Each clan was meant to do four of these migrations, which were supposed to be a series of purification ceremonies. Upon completing this, they would head to the sacred circle and build their permanent settlement, the Hopi Mesas, and chill out till the fifth world was made and they could go there. The Hopi Mesas are three mesas located somewhat close together in Arizona, northeast of Flagstaff, and southwest of Chinle, in pretty much the middle of fucking nowhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been in that area before, yeah. Yeah. Another version of the story is that when the world starts to go bad, before its destruction, those who are deemed worthy are led to an underground sanctuary, where they are protected and cared for by what they call ant people. Ant people, huh? I don't think there's some strange ant-human hybrid. But well, likely, I don't know. I mean, that's all I can think about when I hear about spider grandmother. That's true. But, I mean, I think they're just called that because they live beneath the surface, and so do ants, you know? Oh, uh, my at any God. Rate, oh, my God. Who are the... Oh. On The Simpsons. The crab people. Oh, yeah. Crab people. I think it's <laughs> something like that. Fucking ant people. Yeah, I think those are just people that live underground. But any, at any rate, the ant people care for the survivors and teach them how to survive until the creator says it's cool for them to re-emerge to this new, fresh world. 
a strange thing about ant people besides Mm -hmm. well it's actually in the name the name for ant is anu in hopi and for friend or for people it's naki so the ant people are the anunnaki Mm -hmm. which are the people that are said to have genetically modified humans from our initial creation back in the end of the Luvian times. Oh, so that's who the Anunnaki are. So that's also weird that they would come up with this name separately of something else. That's true, but, you know, I feel like maybe language didn't have the variety that it does today. Well, the Hopi definitely weren't... Their language definitely wasn't inspired by Europeans Mm -hmm. because they evolved independently of one another. Yeah. An Aztec writing translated as the Migration Scroll tells the story of ancient Aztecs moving to Mexico. Some scholars say that their ancestral home of Aztlan is located in the southwest of America. See, now that almost sounds like Aslan. It does a little bit. From Narnia. Maybe they're in Narnia. Or maybe she just sounds the same a lot of times because there's only so many sounds and letter combinations that can be in any kind of language. That's true. Um... But the they think that this area is right around where the Hopi reservation is. So mm-hmm. it's right around these mesas. Just like the Hopi, the Aztec were told that they were supposed to be migrating several times. They got to Mexico and were like, you know, this is pretty fine. And they just stayed there. And so it's said that they that's why the conquistadors destroyed, destroyed them is because they wouldn't continue their migration. And so they they were destroyed. Or maybe they conquistadors just came like, in with yeah. you know forces and better weaponry and the disease, disease. that they weren't <laughs> used to yeah so that might have come into play a little bit i think too not because they you know didn't follow the correct migration patterns right well the only migration patterns that might have been able to save them is that before they even got there that they fucking fled to go to that fucking white city that we mm-hmm. talked about in the central american one Go to that white city and hang from the hide from the conquistadors there. Right. In Navajo tradition, ancient ones were driven from their homes inside the earth by a great flood. They taught humans some shit, and then they went back to their underground homes. It's believed that the humans came up from this flood as well, but they just stayed. Hmm. Uh, in 1909, a guy named G.E. Kincaid, alleged first white person born in Idaho. I don't know. Not. If, oh well. What year was he born? The late 1800s. <laughs> I don't have a specific date. But he found an underground ancient city in a now restricted area of the Grand Canyon. Kincaid worked for the Smithsonian Institute for 30 years, had been an explorer and hunter his whole life. Mm-hmm. The story goes that he was looking for minerals, probably gold or turquoise, because I think both of those are pretty big around there. Right. He was traveling by boat on the Colorado River, and pretty high up he saw stains on the rock. I'm guessing that is like indicative of mineral probably Mm -hmm. i think you know green would be copper and so maybe he saw turquoise or whatever the fuck gold would be i don't know not important after a hell of a climb he finds a mouth of a cave and it's positioned in a way that he didn't know it was even there until he got right up on it well caves can be like that though just inside the entrance on the wall he saw chisel marks nature doesn't make caves using a chisel so he strolled on. Is this on like ninety degrees and ninety degree angles don't exist in nature? Well, chisel marks. Things can look like chisel marks, but not. He says they're chisel marks. Right. So he strolls in to check to check it out. That's so, so interesting because you know in Journey to the Center of the Earth, that's how the dude shows the way. You know, they go into a cave in the side of a fucking mountain, and he leaves like the three chiseled marks. That was the three marks that would show them that they were on the right path. There you go. So I'm just a little bit skeptic already of hey, this. Hey, it worked then. It worked for them. Why don't you think <laughs> it's going to work for these guys? Uh, he did snag a few art- artifacts to send back to the Smithsonian, and he explored this area. And what did the Smithsonian do with the artifacts? I'm just, I'm just curious. I'm, well, they I probably suppressed know. it. Yeah, I mean, well, that's what I'm wondering. You know, did the fucking did they suppress it? Is that the gist of it here? That yet again, the Smithsonian has suppressed the truth. Well, the stuff he found did not look like it belonged in America. He found a golden Buddha-like statue, all kinds of copper and gold urns, vases, cups. He found mummies. The passageways were, as he described, carved unnaturally straight and would veer off at precise angles. 
and there were many hieroglyphs carved throughout. So Similar... it was like he stumbled into like a fucking pyramid. It's what it kind of sounds that like. Was, yeah. That was a mountain covered, like a underground pyramid, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Similar hieroglyphs have been found in southern Arizona. Also found Similar here... to what? This imaginary place that no one's seen? Right. Well, he saw it. And he worked for the Smithsonian. And he was the first white person born in Idaho. So, So, but... He's pretty... Did he take pictures of it or rubbings of it? So how do we know similar ones have been seen? That's what, that's what he claims. That's, okay. These are the claims. Also found here was an unidentified gray metal that was strewn all over the floor. I imagine kind of like, I don't know if you've ever been to a bar where it's just got like wood and shit all over the floor well yeah the sawdust when you puke right yeah yeah that happens a lot in mexico actually yes i i don't doubt that (laughs) Uh, the metal resembles platinum some put forth that the alleged discovery of the city is the reason for the names of the promontories which is a high point of land overlooking or projecting into water or over a low land what names are we talking here well they have egyptian and buddhist inspired names such as osiris's temple shiva temple tower of set etc According to the state archaeologist at the Grand Canyon, early explorers just really dug Egyptian and Buddhist things, and that's why they named the promontories as they did. Right. So, there's a part of the Grand Canyon, allegedly. Allegedly, that's like an underground temple. That is cornered off now, that the Smithsonian is... So they did suppress it? Yeah, it was suppressed. It was suppressed. It was suppressed. They never found... There's, I he didn't, allegedly sent the mummies and the gold and... He didn't send all of that shit. He sent, he's grabbed some artifacts and sent it, but some of the things were... Couldn't, he was just by himself. Right. And it's not like he it's, could call for help. It would be call hard to like help. haul mummies up there. And, yeah, down and, there and then get it in his fucking canoe. Well, down and then up. <laughs> yeah. And then down so... again and then, yeah, into a canoe and down the river, up the river at this point. And so. I don't think that really proves anything about hollow earth. He was like in a mountain, so you're already up, and then you find a cave, which is not at all unusual. Well, what it and is And you is go down into the cave, and you found all this like weird shit. It's linked to the Hopi idea of the Grand Canyon being the Sipapu, and so this is the underground way from the third world, which would be the world literally beneath us, because the, the, the reed grew up, or the bamboo stalk, Grew up and then pierced into this world. I think dude found a cave, took some fucking peyote, and fucking like just tripped some fucking balls as to what the fuck was actually in there. He emerges from there. He's high as fuck. He wanders, you know, never can find the cave again. It's possible. I don't know. I think it's. I well, why didn't he go back? Why didn't anybody go back? If this cave is like right there in the Grand Canyon. I don't know why they didn't go back couldn't get funding to go back it doesn't seem like you're gonna need that much funding to food and keep people drinking in the fucking desert in 19 oh goddamn nine well what was he was he being funded to go down there in the first place the first probably time? by the smithsonian it was he was just going out oh but then oh, he no, found something no, they didn't he want was, him to see no he was looking <laughs> for uh minerals so right. he was probably trying to find gold so he could make some fucking money right and instead found this other thing okay but like nobody else can like find it Apparently, it's can. been it, you can't go there. Apparently, it's restricted. It's restricted. By Smithsonian. Who? The Smithsonian has the Grand Canyon it. Park. They got it restricted. Probably, probably on orders from the Smithsonian. Probably. I mean, that seems like something that they would do. You know, suppressing. Yeah, suppressing. Except that you can hike down the Grand Canyon a lot, and you know. It's a huge fucking national park. It's not like they have, like, guards at all the trailheads. In- they probably do. The restricted <laughs> ones. There's just dudes I mean, in suits believe me, standing in the sweltering heat. There has been very few times where I have seen any ranger on premises outside of the ones that are at the booth that take your money at the entrances. Probably undercovers. Lots of undercovers. So, <laughs> I'm just saying, I feel you like it that, wouldn't be completely inaccessible. You walk into that park and it's like Big Brother. <laughs> no it is not because i was actually at the grand canyon this last summer and, and you i didn't notice fucking the you. rocks with cameras and the, no the i did not lizards. notice anything like that the at camera all. cacti Mm-mm. the other patrons of the park which are actually you know obviously fbi cia right. yes i mean 
I wondered why they the all Grand were wearing Canyon. suits and ties with like dark sunglasses. Yeah, yeah. You're like, <laughs> did I miss the memo or what? <laughs> I didn't realize there was a dress code. Right? Man, if I would have known. So this brings us now to Admiral Richard E. Bird. Dick Bird. Dick Bird. Dick Bird. So a little bit of history on him. May 9th, 1926, Bird served as a navigator on a 15-hour, 30-minute flight over the North Pole. Mm -hmm. It's a long fucking flight. That is really long. And this was in 1926, so there's not... These aren't Jesus awesome Christ. airplanes. These no, are, these are like cloth airplanes. These aren't even as good as airplanes that they had in World War II. Mm -hmm. These were like, this must have been cold. I'm oh, sure yeah. it was covered, but it wasn't insulated. It probably wasn't even fully covered. Your head is like still sticking out. Maybe. I don't know. This is a little bit after World War I. So. But not much after and 1926. I mean, that's. Yeah, it's, it's a few years after. A few years. But, but I I'm don't imagining think that, that they probably, if this is a North Pole run. I'm sure that they've got. I don't know. At any rate, he received the Congressional Medal of Honor along with the pilot because it was the first time that anyone had ever done that. Now evidence did come up in 1996 suggesting that it is possible that they did not actually accomplish this mission but actually fell 100 miles, 161 kilometers short. Of the North Pole? Yes. In a diary or a journal or something. Um, this expedition was financed by Edsel Ford and John D. Rockefeller Jr. Mm, so that's some big money in that. Yeah. Ford, that's of the, yeah, the, Ford, the Ford, like the fucking yeah, car. The yeah. car. Mm -hmm. In January of 1929, Bird was sent to Antarctica at the head of an expedition consisting of 42 men, 84 sled dogs, two ships, and three airplanes. Here he established a coastal base camp called Little America, located on the Ross Ice Shelf near the Bay of Wales. This was established in a place where they could contact outside of the Antarctic and they could easily be resupplied. November 29th of this year, Bird and three others are the first people to fly over the South Pole in an 18-hour, 41-minute flight from their base over the South Pole and back. Jesus Christ. They just put a shitload of fuel in it. And I don't know if they refueled while they were flying or if they had to land or what, but... Well, even if you land, where do you refuel at? Well, they carried all the fuel with them. They just jam-packed the back with the fucking fuel and flew in this metal death machine in 1929. Jesus Christ. In the South mm. Pole for almost a full day. Three guys. I'm surprised they were even able to get off the ground with that much fuel. Fucking crazy shit. If you're hearing this in your Rolls Royce, then Donald Trump's tax plan is for you. You're rich as hell. We're going to give you a tax cut? But for everyone else, there's Kamala Harris's plan. Under my plan, more than 100 million Americans will get a tax cut. Because that guy in the Ferrari doesn't need another break. But Kamala Harris knows you sure could use one. Paid for by FFPAC, FFPAC.org. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. Bird led a second expedition, 1933 to 1935. He ended up alone in a weather station over 100 miles, 161 kilometers, from Little America. He had this vent, or this heater there that was not really vented properly. And so it was just pumping carbon monoxide into this place. And he was, like, getting super fucked up. Right. And he was talking to him over the radio and just talking all kinds of crazy talk. Just fucked up. And that's the only reason they decided to find him. Like, maybe we should go see right. what's happening like, there. Right, seems like something's He's amiss. just talking, yeah, things are certainly amiss here. And so they did show up and pulled him out, and he was fine. <laughs> but, yeah, probably hallucinating like a motherfucker. The third time that he goes on to a mission to Antarctica is in 1939. And this is to make sure that Germany wasn't trying, Nazi Germany, mm -hmm. wasn't trying to establish a base west of the 180th Meridian. If Germany were to do this, it would be considered an unfriendly act per the Monroe Doctrine. Simply put, the Monroe Doctrine came into effect in the 1820s, right around the same time that South America was getting its independence from Spain. Mm -hmm. And it gave a line to the old powers of Europe that they were not allowed to put bases over. America wasn't going to fuck with any of their shit, but they had to stay off of our hemisphere. That included South America. So Germany, we wanted to make sure, wasn't, they're an old power. We're making sure they weren't going over this basically you know giving us an excuse to to declare war exactly on his way to the antarctic bird hooked up with his crew at panama canal 
Before leaving Washington, he was giving orders so secret that him even receiving said order was a secret. So how we know about this super secret right. must have been spilled later. I mean, I guess it's been a long time. Leading up to this expedition, America had been building this big-ass polar explorer vehicle. It was designed by Byrd's second command, the guy that pulled him out of the uh, station when mm-hmm. he was dying of carbon monoxide poisoning. This guy's name is Dr. Thomas C. Poulter. Um, this beast of a machine weighed about 45,000 pounds, which is 20 metric tons. Jesus Christ. Had It had 10-foot, 3-meter, 1,900-pound tires. That's 862 kilograms. It was going to carry four men in a plane. This vehicle, along with six army tanks, was going to carry enough supplies for a year-long mission that could cover an estimated 500,000 miles of unknown Antarctica, which is 800,000 kilometers. He was just like, look, this is what we need in order to Just some big survey the motherfucking land. badass machine. Because it's fucking brutal out there. Yeah. The media reported on this machine and even reported that it was a race between the USA and Nazis to claim areas in Antarctica rich in resources. Every step of the way to Antarctica was followed and reported by American journalists. When it went from different places in the States before it went on to a boat, there was reporters talking about it and interviewing the people and taking pictures. People were talking about it in the news because it was creating like big traffic jams mm-hmm. because it was having to get through a city. Right. All the way to when it gets dumped off into the Antarctic. It's being covered. Then they suddenly just stop talking about it. How the fuck did it even get there? A big ass boat. I guess. Yeah, like be... an aircraft carrier or something probably. I don't know if they had those back then. But I know. That's why I'm thinking, like, how, least. what did they even have that was that huge? Yeah. To get it there in the first place. Maybe in, it sank and, you know, they didn't want to admit that. Maybe. But in May of 1940, the New York Times reported on Byrd's Antarctic expedition. In this, Byrd said they'd found 900 miles of coastline that ac- explorers have been seeking for hundreds of years and accomplished more than he'd expected. He also mentioned that 59 men had been left there to continue with the mission. He never mentioned the snow cruiser. No one asked him about it. Apparently, it didn't really work that well. (laughs) It just kind of got abandoned. It fucking sank on the way there and everything. And it got covered in snow and they lost it. It was seen in 1958, but then it got covered in snow and they've lost it again. And they're not sure if it's still on land or if it's at the bottom of the ocean someplace at this point. But it really was not... A great piece of machinery. It was just huge. It was great in size, but not in functionality. I'm sure it looked (laughs) awesome. In 1947, Admiral Byrd is on an expedition in the Arctic. So the Arctic this time, the north one. It's called Operation High Jump. Its primary goal is to establish a base. Byrd headed an outfit of 4,000 British, Australian, and American troops in addition to 13 ships, including an aircraft carrier, submarines, and planes. These were all military vessels, not one specifically scientific ship in the lot. This, of course, was not public information at the time. It was just exploration. Nothing military to see here. During one of his flights, some kind of reconnaissance mission, Bird's instruments start to malfunction. Well, that sounds like a plight to me, you know. (laughs) What? So that sounds like a plight. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, Both the magnetic and gyro compasses go all wonky, so he is unable to navigate using these instruments. Fortunately, he is a badass pilot, so he can fly anyway. In the distance, he sees a mountain range he's not seen before. He flies towards it to find green rolling hills and streams. He sees a mammoth wandering around, and the outside thermometer reads 74 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 23 Celsius. Are you sure he's not getting that carbon monoxide Tripping again? poisoning Nope. Again? He's, he, that is not the case. Uh, I'm pretty sure mammoths were extinct. He says that he can no longer see the sun, and yet there is still light, but it's a different kind of light. As the flight continues over this green, lush environment, the navigation functions normally, and they see ahead what appears to be a city. Bird estimates that he is now 1,700 miles beyond the North Pole. It's 22,735 kilometers. 
He uses beyond the North Pole. So. So he's it's. But wouldn't it just be like on the other side of the North Pole? Like, well, he's inside of Earth now. Though the navigation equipment isn't functioning as it should, the plane is sluggish to respond. Two disc-shaped aircraft appear with a type of swastika on the sides of them. The plane's engines cut off, and with what we would call a tractor beam, the plane is landed. Over the radio, Bert is welcomed by name and told not to worry. Does the, it have a German accent? The yes, voice that's <laughs> it totally does. It says it specifically. It has a Nordic or German accent. Interesting. And a, it says a flying saucer with fucking swastikas. Now, a swastika is a remarkably old symbol. Yes, it it's is. Been, it's been in all kinds of cultures all over the world have used it. But it was just then being adopted by the Nazi party at just the Just like that mustache, the Nazis ruined that sign. Right. The last entry in his flight log is that he sees tall, seemingly unarmed, blonde men approaching the plane on foot. In the distance, he can see a city that pulsates with rainbow hues of color. A voice orders him by name to open the cargo door, and he does. He's just going to open the cargo door. <laughs> right? Very James Bondy. Bird and his radio man are escorted on some sort of floating panel to the city, which Bird describes as seeming to be made out of crystal. They're put in a room, given some something to drink. It's very tasty. Savory and tasty and warm, he said. Savory, tasty, and warm, but not... Like anything he's ever drank on Earth? No, or, not on the know, surface. Not on the surface. After 10 minutes or so, a couple guys come and get Bird and escort him to the Master. I always imagine the Master from Doctor Who, but that's not what I really get from this story. He gets led down a corridor and up an elevator. He said it reminds him of Buck Rogers. So, some Enterprise-looking shit, you know? Mm -hmm. This whole time, all of these folks have been super polite to him. He hasn't been threatened in, in, in any way at all. So he gets to this master Except character. Except for the point where, you know, he was, like, forced to land via tractor beam. And well, he wasn't threatened. They simply landed his plane. And they're just like, okay, you're going down. But they, they, were, they were polite the whole time. Mm -hmm. So he gets to this master Take character. Take him into custody. Yeah, give him a drink. It was a nice drink. Mm -hmm. So the master welcomes him, greets him politely. Bird is told that they are inside the earth. And they know all kinds of shit about the outside of the Earth. The Master tells him that they are called the Ariani. And they allowed Bird entry because they were familiar with him and knew him to be a good guy. He was super famous. He was a hero and an explorer and like an all-American patriot because of all this crazy shit he'd done with airplanes. Right. He'd flown over the Atlantic and over parts of, the, I believe, the sub-Atlantic or something where... Just shit no one had done before. He was like, no, I'll mm -hmm. do it. Give me some gloves. Let's fucking fly. So he was kind of a badass. So I'm sure he was like, I figured you'd heard of me. Right. Well, kind of like Charles Lindbergh was like. Right. Usually, yeah. Exactly. They had been content to let people on the Earth's surface do their own shit until atomic power had been tapped. Once they bombed Japan, the Ariani sent their flying machines called Flugelrads to see what the fuck had happened. This is explaining why there are only really a lot of UFO, definite UFO sightings after the 1940s. After we dropped the bomb, the Flugelrads came up, so it's actually not extraterrestrial, it's interterrestrial. I see. The Flugelrads were met with hostility by the air forces of the time and were attacked when spotted. Emissaries from the Ariani, according to what the Master had told Bird, were sent to each of Earth's major powers telling them to back off on the nukes. They obviously were not heated, and Bird was warned that humans had reached a point of no return and a new Dark Age was imminent, one that would encompass the Earth and possibly destroy humanity. He did say that the Ariani would help whoever survived this Dark Age to revive culture and what have you. Uh, Bird was given a message to deliver to humankind and brought back to his radio man. The both of them were then returned to the plane and assisted via tractor beam by the Flugelrads to the surface before he was again in control of the plane. Now, does the radio man have the... Does he, like, a... Uh, he corroborates the he whole corroborates thing. He corroborates the whole thing? Yeah. They reestablish contact with a relieved base camp when they're about 27 minutes away. On March 11th, 1947, it's said that Admiral Byrd fully reported his experience, including the message from the Ariani, 
which is that they were opposed to our use of atomic weapons. At the Pentagon, to which the president was advised, Byrd was ordered to keep quiet about all of this. Which he did because he was a good... I mean, he was an admiral because he earned it, not because he was rich or something. The reason that we have this information is allegedly there's some sort of deathbed diary kind of thing that was found. This particular... So did he ever say this himself, though? He died. Any of this stuff? He died in 1959. Well, yeah, but and before are, he died, did there, he tell anybody any of this? There are some... He didn't say anything about what I just said. That's okay. all found in his diary. But there are some quotes that he has that could be taken to mean... His diary or maybe a book he was going to write or something, a science fiction novel. Right. You know, it's, it's hard I, to say. It. I mean, and he then wasn't... people are taking it as truth because I have a very hard time believing he had such a vivid experience and never said anything about that. Well, we'll get to it. We'll get to all of that. So during Byrd's 1947 Arctic flight, an Antarctic flight was happening as well. This account from Lieutenant Commander David Bunger was a discovery of an Antarctic oasis. There is an ice-free area about four miles from the coastline, 6.4 kilometers, and contained a few large lakes of liquid water. Bunger landed his plane on one of these lakes and noted that the water was much warmer than that of the ocean. Roughly square-shaped, two sides of the oasis rose up high into giant walls of ice, while the other two sides had a gradual slope. This area is now known as Bunger Hills, and scientists aren't sure why it exists. But that's a place that, if you're allowed to go to Antarctica, you can go fucking see that. Right. In January of 1956, Byrd led yet another expedition, Operation Deep Freeze, to the Antarctic, to where he allegedly flew 2,300 miles beyond, there's that word again, mm -hmm. beyond the South Pole. That's 3,700 kilometers. Bird is quoted as saying about this 1956 expedition, the present expedition has opened up a vast new land. Operation Deep Freeze was all about setting up another permanent research facility in Antarctica. Right. Bird died March 11th, 1957. Now, some have compared the journal to the other of his few writings, letters and what have you, and also to his manner of speech because he was oftentimes interviewed. You can find interviews all over of him. He was... A fucking hero. Right. And I they just... discount the journal as a fake. They say that also a lot of license has been taken with the few quotes and they've been, they've been maybe taken out of context and stretched to well, yeah, I think mean this Hollow Earth stuff. This journal I thing mean, is... He was, he was quite the patriot. So if he did see this shit, he would have totally kept it quiet. Possibly, but I don't... If I think if he was that much of a patriot, he wouldn't have even written it down. Probably. And they, like and I said, I, mean, I think this all sounds kind of like he's just writing on his own some sort of like fantastical, like. Or not even writing at all. It's just something that was surfaced that someone decided was something from him. Right. It's, or it's maybe really... he did it and it's like, okay, what if I discovered this when I was out on one of my missions? Like he's like writing a story. It could have been. A, He's taking stuff from his life and then trying to write like a science fiction novel out of it. I mean, maybe come he on, was like into Nazi it. Yeah. fucking I, UFOs with swastikas. I mean, well, like I said, swastika that that and alone, like a whole I mean, like Aryan race of people living in this thing. I mean, that's just yeah. Aryan races are talked about amongst many different cultures. Right, but still, it, it seems like that, that's the whole point. Is that that's kind of like a that's a very formulary type of story it seems that's, like to that's me. true it's also so, but maybe it wasn't so much back then i mean we i just, think even more so back then i mean you think about Nazis. like the, you know the comic books and stuff that were like back then they had a lot of formularies but stuff like that i don't know but it was still kind of new so it was probably not as apparent to a, the layman at least yeah maybe not i can see I mean, where like maybe it was taken English out of major, contest yeah. where somebody was like oh like he must actually have experienced this because he could have been writing in the first person, but again, like he's writing a fictional story. You know? Yeah, I mean, well, some fiction, some works of fiction are written in the first person. Many works of fiction are written in the first person. That's true. It's actually. And if I were to, to like just to person, write it down, I find, and I'm taking stuff from like my real life, like places I've really been, and then I'm totally making stuff up built on that and i'm writing it in the first person because this is my draft of my first person fiction right, novel somebody right, totally. i could die and somebody could be like oh my god like 
she really she did saw this, this stuff. She no, saw this stuff. You're, that's very true. Yeah. That's very true. Well, in 1959, a book was published called Worlds Beyond the Poles. It was published in New York and written by F. Amadio Giannini. The publisher did not advertise the book, so it remained mostly unknown. That same year, a magazine, Flying Saucers, attempted to print a story of bird discoveries after the editor, Ray Palmer, read about them in the aforementioned book. Kind of gets a little weird here because it wasn't oh, weird. Oh, now it gets a little weird? Because it wasn't weird before. <laughs> so when the truck showed up to deliver the magazines to the publisher, it was empty. No shipping receipt could be found, and the printing plates, when they finally got them back, were so badly damaged, the issue could not be repressed right away. Reprinted right away. <laughs> About five... It was repressed later. Yes. <laughs> About 5,000 subscribers did not get this issue of the magazine, though at least one newsstand owner did. He got 750 copies. But then he disappeared, and so did the magazines. Shipments sent to this particular distributor had instructions that if they could not be delivered, they were to be returned to the sender, this magazine, but they were not, and they never turned up. Some believe this was done to cover up the information contained in the magazine, However, several months later, they recreated the issue, printed it, and sold it with no problems. Hmm. So. If it was only several months later and they were allowed to do it, that seems like. Not very conspiracy or not very right. good at it. I was thinking maybe it was one of those, like, you know, anti-communist groups, maybe. that. Yeah, that would have been a group that would have done something. Mm-hmm. And would have been active at that time. Right. Sounds a little McCarthyist to me. <laughs> as long as they weren't, you know, as long as they weren't communist hollow earthers, everything's good. Because we can't have that going on. No, we'll have none of that. So another guy, a fellow named Dr. Raymond Bernard, wrote a book called The Hollow Earth in 1964. In well, this... I like that it's to the point. <laughs> yeah, he's not dicing his words at all. In this book, he relates to a story from a patient of a Dr. Nephi Cotton of L.A., a man from Norway. That's the patient. The man says that one summer, he and a buddy decided to go as far north as they could in a boat, packed a month's supply of food and whatnot, and they embarked on their journey in a small fishing boat. A month's supply in a small fishing boat? Hmm. At the end of the month, they found themselves beyond the North Pole and in a climate they had not expected. Warm. Almost too warm to sleep, they said. Ahead of them, they saw a giant mountain, where it appeared the em the ocean was emptying into. Curious, they continued towards the mountain, until they found themselves in a canyon leading inside the earth. Were there dragons? They did not talk about dragons. Well, you know, like, that sounds like a flat earther thing, almost. Like, you know, you're going to pour at the, you reach the end of the world and beyond them. And as dragons. the gravity takes over from you yeah. going through the mm. hole, it puts you onto a river is what I'm imagining these guys are trying to tell us. As they continued their trek, they saw an astonishing sight, a sun inside the earth. The ocean flowing through this canyon eventually became a river that the travelers assume wound its way through the center of the earth and out the South Pole. They noted that the plants and trees were larger than normal, and so were the people they eventually ran into who were giants. These giants, giants again, huh? Giants again. These giants had houses and towns just like ours, but, you know, larger, obviously. You Somehow know. I imagine this river ride to be something like Splash Mountain. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you go this up. This little boat, and it's and sort of like giants. And, and then you're you're in the dark, like, ca cave part, and there's Br'er Rabbit, and yeah, totally. all of the buddies, and they're all singing, and... And, and then drop out, down, drop down out of giants. There. Yep. There appeared to be what was an electric monorail system that ran beside the river. From like the suburbs to the town. Nice little transportation. Mm -hmm. Shocked but friendly, the giants offer the two service dwellers their hospitality in the form of a dinner. Each traveler goes to a different giant's home, and they're given portions of food so large they could eat it for a week. All the fruits and vegetables they were given were huge. But also way better, like super sweet and stuff. Like the grapes mm -hmm. were the size of... Um, Watermelons? No, peaches. Peaches, okay. So pretty big. Not as big as watermelons, though. Not as big as watermelons. 
this actually sounds quite a bit what like what Moses's uh, scouts report when they see the giants in Exodus. They say they see him harvesting large vegetables and shit. So this just sounds like a lot of folklore too, though. I mean, you find this in uh, Olivia wanted to to look at Grimm's fairy tales because she was reading all these articles about like the real stories behind the Disney princess stories. Oh yeah, the ones that are actually fucked up fucked up and super dark and stuff and so she wanted to find them and i have like this really nice edition of you know complete set of Gr- Grimm's fairy tales that i loved when i was little and so i busted that out and i was rereading some of the ones and so many of them are where somebody like they go somewhere and a giant cave like mountain like opens up and like there's this whole other world with like giants and hollow earth man yeah craziness within this mountain that turns out to be like a hollow place and so, yeah, nothing new, Norwegian sailor boys. Well, in the year they spent with these... something original here. In the year they spent with these giants, they saw oh, they all spent kinds of... a whole of, year with them, huh? Uh, spent a whole year. Uh, saw wondrous technologies and other unnamed, strange, and unusual things. They just said strange and unusual things. Strange and unusual things, okay. When they decided to return to the surface, the giants offered them a hand if they needed it. Um, I did look up what kind of doctor... Dr. Nephi Cotton was. Right. Couldn't find anything about him. Mm-hmm. Who knows what kind of doctor he is. Maybe he was a psychiatrist or a psychologist or something. It's right. Hard to say. In several of these uh, hideous documentaries, which I could never even get through, that was, you know, a professor of UFOs. And it's like, hmm. Like, what school did you go to? Exactly. Are you just a professor who digs on UFOs? Yeah, like, are or... you an actual professor and you really like UFOs? Or is professor of UFOs kind of like a made-up thing where you're not actually ha- have gone to the schooling that you- is usually required to have the title of professor? Right, right. That Maybe would, you can just That would be at minimum, internet. like, a master's degree in education. And usually then you're just like a teacher. I mean, you're not the, a professor. Through the Universal Life Church, for 10 bucks, you can get a <laughs> uh, title. Right. Get cardinal. Mm-hmm. Normally those have to be, those are a high, you know, the right below the Pope in the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. You have to have done a whole lot. Yes, a whole lot. In order to attain that level. Well. So, yeah. Now we've got Nazis. Now, oh, now we're on a Nazis. Yeah. Now we're on to Nazis. Fucking Nazis. <clears throat> fucking they just Nazis. had their fucking fingers in so many pies. It was like... <laughs> so many, all kinds of things. Yeah. Putting fingers everywhere. Yeah. Filthy Nazis. Disgusting. So this starts with the Thule Society. The Thule Society was a group of, a group of people who are very concerned with the origins of the Aryan race. Members had to be white. Quote, no Jewish or colored blood flows in either his or in his wife's veins. Unquote. So not only did you yourself have to be uh, white and not a Jew, but you could not be married to anyone who wasn't white or... Exactly. They believed that the ancient Greek stories of the land of Thule to the north was the capital of Hyperborea, which we briefly mentioned in our Giants episode. Mm -hmm. Hyperborea is the land beyond the north wind, according to the ancient Greeks. It's actually far to the north of Thule in their writings, but whatever. Whatever. Taking these ancient Greek ideas and combining them with the writings of American politician Ignatius L. Donnelly about Atlantis, he wrote Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, which was published in 1882, they believed that the Aryans who lived on Atlantis originated in Thule Hyperborea and that they are the race that created the humans that, that were then genetically modified by the Anunnaki. Interesting. This is all antediluvian stuff, which means before the flood. Donnelly puts the destruction of Atlantis at the same time as the biblical flood. Hmm. Maybe it's just more propaganda to promote that white Aryans are like the actual like rulers of the world. 1882 America was still a very, very racist place. Yes. It was just 20 years after the slaves were freed. Mm-hmm. This guy was not cool with blacks i'm sure at all probably not so i'm pretty sure that's also why the nazis were hip they're like yeah we can get behind all of this yeah like this totally lines up with our way of thinking so this group started in 1918 and at its height boasted 250 followers in munich and around 1500 in the rest of germany 
and they were super racist. They were very against Jews and communists. And the same year the society started, they purchased a local newspaper, which became the main Nazi newspaper, called in English, People's Observer. Members of the, Th of the Thule Society started the German Workers' Party in 1919, which Adolf Hitler joined in September, and by February of 1920 had been changed up a bit and renamed the National Socialist German Workers' Party. The motherfucking Nazis. Right. Hitler began to distance the new Nazi party from the Thule Society. In 1933, laws were passed against occult shit. Though some people say Hitler was super into these newly banned ideas, his passing of these laws seemed to say the contrary, as did his speech against occultism in September of 1938. Well, maybe he just wanted to wield all the power of it if it was there. I believe that. Yeah. Uh, nevertheless, some heavy hitters in the Nazi party are alleged to be Thule Society, including Rudolf Hess and Heinrich Himmler. Oh, wow. They were high up. In 1930, 1934 to 35, and 1938 to 39, these guys sent German expeditions to Tibet, likely looking for Shambhala and possibly the entrance to Hollow Earth. It's The Tibetans were cool with the Nazis because they saw them as fulfilling part of the destiny. The Tibetans are the good guys. Mm -hmm. The Nazis are the bad guys, sort of the yin and the yang. And the Nazis were going to bring about this new like spiritual change through their evil. Interesting. So they're like, oh, you're the fuckwads we've been waiting for. Exactly. <laughs> Also, in 1938, the German research ship Schwabenland left Hamburg heading towards the Antarctic. All of the hand-picked crew of the vessel, including top pilots, technicians, biologists, meteorologists, oceanographers, and earth scientists, were under strict orders to not disclose their mission. They left December 17, 1938, and returned April 11, 1939. This was the third German Antarctic expedition— this is the one that Bird was sent down to with the big snow machine to sort right. of see what the deal was. There's a theory out there that Hitler and several thousand other Nazis escaped the Allied forces by heading into the hollow earth at the Antarctic entrance. Well, of course they did. Apparently, during the Nuremberg trials, Admiral Donitz of the German Navy spoke about an invisible fortif fortification in the midst of eternal ice. Mm-hmm. An interesting thing about the Antarctic is in 1961, the Antarctic Treaty System was created. This treaty regulates international relations to Antarctica as it is the only continent on the planet without a native human population. Basically, it sets aside Antarctica as an area for a scientific investigation only and bans military activity. They allow the military there as sort of backup for the scientists, right. but they're not allowed to be doing military shit. In case shit. Like, there's a need of rescue. And stuff exactly. Like that. It gives each of the signing countries, 53 as of 2016, up from 12 at its beginning, jurisdiction over their own people sent there. That means unless your government isn't cool, you ain't going. So that's sort of weird. They're not they're not allowing people to just go there. You just right. Elon you can't Musk just you can't, can't just, just go, go to, to Antarctica no. and and sightsee and no, not at all. Well. Probably, you know, it's probably not a very touristy place. I don't think I would want to go. No. Cold. It, very cold. Very cold. There's much more places that are very cold that are set up for people to, to visit that are probably a much more pleasant experience. Yes. So we're going to talk about a couple modern, like present day. I imagine maybe it's because, sorry, I imagine maybe it's because there is no native population. Then how do you work out the monies made off of? tourism and stuff oh exactly like, that. like yeah and who's it going to go to exactly it could only corporations you don't want corporations buying that right. shit up so you that's... don't necessarily want people drilling down there mm -hmm. if there's a hollow earth entrance then you know probably they probably don't want motherfuckers fucking too, around I there guess. yeah yeah so we're going to get into a couple present day more modern hollow earth theories or people who are proponents of it and then we're going to talk about inhabitants of hollow earth a man named Dallas Thompson was in a horrendous car accident. His car had been crushed so thoroughly that when the firefighters pried it open, they were shocked to find him alive. While trapped in the car, he had seen a light so bright that it had made him illegally blind, and it also allegedly gave him some hidden knowledge. 
The earth is hollow, and there is an opening at the North Pole. He revealed that he had secured funding to travel into the entrance using a solo trek, which is an exoskeletal helicopter. It's fucking awesome. So you got like, it looks a little bit like the thing from Aliens that Ripley gets into, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't have the big claw hands. And then it's got these two propellers, like on those planes that can Mm -hmm. just lift straight up and they're coming off your shoulders and behind you a bit. And these things exist. Neato. Totally cool. So he was going to take one of these things there for us on a solo trip. He had the funding. He said, going to go to Anto- or down to uh, the Arctic and go into the hollow earth. His date for the trip was May 24th, 2003. However, the last time he's been heard of was on a Yahoo Groups post on January 11th, 2003. So, so no one's heard from him since, huh? No one's heard from him since. Maybe he's just rocking it. Maybe he's in Hollow Earth. He is rocking it in Hollow Earth, and he just doesn't want to come back. He's like, you know Could what? This well is be. so cool. I'm never coming back. I don't care. I don't give a fuck. Right? I mean, the the fruit there is huge. Can you imagine all the wine I could make with fruit that big? Tons of wine. Wine for days. For days. Be drunk 24-7 on fruit wine. That's right. So another sort of weird thing, and this is more mathy. This isn't just something, some vision, some guy in a car accident had or anything like that. <laughs> right. God. That between the sun and a planet is like a sweet spot. This is where satellites can sit, where the gravity of the planet is pulling it just as much as that of the sun, so it doesn't go either way, so it maintains its orbit. This is something that scientists can very precisely calculate. The place that we place satellites around our Earth is 12,000 miles off from where the center of the Earth should be, suggesting that the information we have about the density and size of the, of the planet doesn't make sense with other data we know and have tested and, in fact, use. So that's weird. That is weird. I feel like that's just a lot of shit meant to confuse people, though. Maybe. I mean, you talk enough crazy talk. It's like being a lawyer. Right. Okay. If the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. True. That's true. So now we'll wind down here with the inhabitants of Hollow Earth. There's quite a few. It's pretty... uh, Well, there's giants for one. Right. We'll get... There are giants. Oh, yeah. There are... Let's see here. Antediluvian angel-fucked hybrid things Mm -hmm. are possibly there. The technologically advanced virates. Fucked by an angel. That would be a great show. You remember that show, Touched by an Angel? (laughs) Yeah, Fucked by an Angel. Fucked by an Angel. We've got technologically advanced giants, Nephilim and Anunnaki, Mm -hmm. all possibly living there. We possibly have survivors of Atlantis and Lemuria living there. Well, I don't think that their survivors of Atlantis would be living there. I think, like, descendants of the... Per, that's another one. I, I mean, unless uh, people just live forever down there. Reptilians and gray aliens. Dinosaurs, duh. Nazis. Uh, yes, we got some Escaped Nazis. Nazis. Now, yep. now we've got some, we got some weird, some, some less listy ones here. So there's the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel. According to author Rodney Clough, they were led to the North Pole entrance to the interior by God. The ten lost tribes of Israel are the tribes that that disappeared during the mass Israelite deportation by the Neo-Assyrian Empire in 722 BCE. Clough had actually attempted to search for the entrance to the Hollow Earth, but key members of the group kept dying. One in a plane crash, another from an inoperable brain cancer, and then the funding fell through. From what I can tell, Clough mainly used the Book of Mormon and the Bible as proof of Hollow Earth. Oh, well, the Book of Mormon. There was lots of references to those (laughs) things. So, Carl Unger, a German U-boat guy, sailor, I guess, on the U-boat 209 during World War II, supposedly wrote a letter that was delivered to his friend after the war. Its loose translation is as follows. Dear old comrade, the news will be a surprise for you. The U-209 undersea boat made it. The earth is hollow. Dr. Hauschofar and Hess were right. The whole crew as well, but they cannot come back. We are no prisoners. Now, I don't know if not or now we are not prisoners or we are now prisoners. I'm not sure exactly hmm. which one. One little letter makes a quite yeah, a bit of difference. Yeah, it does make a big difference. I am sure this news will reach you. It is the last connection with the U-Boat 209. We will meet again, comrade. I am worried for everyone who has to spend his life on the surface of the earth since the Fuhrer is gone. Bless our Germany always with hearty greetings. That doesn't sound like propaganda at all. Especially Not even since a little. 
so he went to, so he was already in hollow earth apparently when he wrote this because he's saying how it's true right and somehow the communication so got, they have like a postal service i guess to send this letter so there was somewhere to like you know mail this letter from in and they got earth. it and they got it like two years after the war or something so mm-hmm. in like 1947 so mm-hmm. you know the person that received it says it was definitely his friend's handwriting Oh, definitely. Yes, I recognize his handwriting, and that was his handwriting. So, In Indian mythology, there are a people called the Naga, a subterranean snake race. This is an advanced people with high technology and are contemptuous of humans. They are, is that why they just stay under the ground and they don't ever come to see us? Well, they sometimes abduct humans for torture or interbreeding. Oh, and dear. sometimes to eat. That sounds unfortunate. In all respects. Where do they abduct them from? Did they have to come up through like a pyramid or? It did not say exactly. I'm assuming that since this is an Indian thing, probably in India. Okay, so it's so strictly one of the... restricted to India. This is like the are... India underworld? Not the Naga are an Indian belief. <laughs> they c- people can say that they are I was gonna what say, the reptilian aliens are, they are potentially so, are there any portholes in national forests like, it's possible some things. <laughs> it's possible but these are p- what people will say where we get the reptilian style aliens that they're not actually aliens that they're mm-hmm. living in hollow earth and that the indians know of these people right kind of like the aliens in v which yes when you want to talk about nazis and stuff when you watch that miniseries now as an adult, I'm like, okay, number one, this is a great movie that exercises why we need to keep the right to bear arms. It's not that our own government might become fascist and we might have to fight against some fucking fascist aliens. Or Red might... Dawn sort of scenario where Mexico invades. <laughs> right? <laughs> you fascist never know. aliens could invade Earth and we are going to need our fucking automatic weapons to fucking defend ourselves and take our fucking Earth back. Okay? Or Russian, Russian-backed Russian Mexican communists. Right? Right? But you, you look at the aliens themselves, they have that weird symbol that's like highly swastika-like. Yes. And yes. they are There's obviously defi- a take on that. Totally, totally fascist. They're obviously like meant to emulate the Nazis. And the new series is very good too. I am so mad that they can't. Was it one or two seasons that they had? At least two. It's possible I think it did three. No, but... it was like two because then it was like, God damn it. I was so excited. It was for the good. No- yeah, it was so good. I loved the chick in there. Which one? The one that played the. The one that played the leader. Marina Baccarin. Yes. Yeah. She was in Firefly and she's in oh Gotham. Oh my God. Yeah. She's she, awesome. She was so good in that role. And she's I'm, a very good actress. Mm-hmm, and I'm really pissed that that thing only lasted a couple of seasons. So as mentioned, of course, we have Agartha, the uh, Ariani, Agarthan, whatever, those people. Tall, blonde haired, blue eyed folks who for some reason speak German. Mm hmm. Bird, I forgot to say, Bird actually said they said they, they told him a Vita Zane when he was le- uh, leaving. So. Oh, okay. Um, others say that the Agarthans are a, are a highly technological race that live beneath our planet in crazy cities with moving sidewalks and free energy and tube-like transportation, like in the Jetsons. Mm-hmm. They're involved in the intergalactic community and frequently leave the planet on business or whatever. Agarthans are made up of descendants of Atlanteans, Lemurians, Hyperboreans, you know, from Hyperborea, and Nazi Germans, all living together in harmony. <laughs> We've got a race of people simply called the Old Ones. Uh, They lived on the surface of this planet millions of years ago. They evolved well before humans. They are highly advanced and have since moved under the surface of the planet. They are hominid, longer lifespans than humans, and just generally let humans do human stuff. But sometimes they kidnap human children to tutor them and raise them as their own. Interesting. Because what? Are they unable to have their own children? Doesn't say specifically. Hmm. There's a lot of different stories and different mythologies that talk about children being stolen and replaced. Like the changeling idea in, I believe, Irish mm-hmm. mythology where the yeah. the changeling will replace your baby yes. with a colicky one. Mm-hmm. That's one of theirs and you know they'll raise yours. It's a evil fairy thing. Right. Another group of folk living in the hollow earth are called the Elder Race, also known as Titans. They come from a different planet in prehistoric times, only to find out that our sun aged them prematurely. So they built these expansive underground cities, but eventually abandoned them in search of a new home. Probably one where they didn't have to live underground. 
They left robots in the underground city called Darrow and Taro. Darrow are bad, Taro are good. This information came by way of a man named Richard Sharp Shaver. Richard Dick Sh- Sharp Shaver. Dick, Dick Sharp Shaver. His story was published in Amazing Stories magazine in 1945, and he spoke of him meeting the Taro who told him about the Elder Race. Hmm. Chances are pretty good that Shaver was a paranoid schizophrenic, and his <laughs> l- stories are largely thought of as fiction. Really? That so surprises me. <laughs> in 1846... Marshall Gardner found a frozen woolly mammoth in Siberia. As a believer in a hollow earth with one son, he believed the reason the mammoth was so fresh appearing was that because it had died recently. Not that, like, oh, it's Siberia and it's fucking cold as fuck and it will mummify something and make it look very much like it just died when actually it's been dead for a fucking shitload of time millions of years yeah yeah well it was 1846 and they thought it was fresh have you watched fortitude yet like i fucking told you to nope okay well there that is part of the a thing in fortitude about how nobody can die there because it's so cold that oh that they they don't stay decompose. fresh <laughs> yeah they don't decompose there's people the people that have already died there there's people with like that have died with like active plague right there or violence yeah but the fact that it's like plague and it's like still like active almost like it's still like a dangerous oh i see yeah thing because they haven't decomposed at all because of the climate there so crazy yeah so i'm guessing that would be the reason for the you know mammoth looking so fresh well he hypothesized that the mammoth had wandered outside of the inner earth at the north north pole frozen and then was carried by the ice flow to siberia this is not the only prehistoric animal that has been found. In 1977, a baby mammoth was found frozen in Siberia, and there are reports of woolly rhino, steppe lions, giant deer, some kind of fox, and a hardy breed of horse also being found. So that I don't dispute at all, but again, it's because of the it's fucking because climate. It's because they froze, not because they were fresh. Right. Some postulate that there are many kinds of extinct animals living in hollow earth, not just mammoths. Well, yeah, they did that in Jules Verne. They had dimetrodons. Yep. All the vegetation is alleged to be giant. Grapes right. the size of plums. Again, I want to make wine out of that shit. And again, I think they had that in the in the, in the stupid, you know, during the center of the earth. I feel like there was something with oh, the yeah, giant Oh, yeah, I think it was all something. the giant yeah. all the giant plants, too. Mm-hmm. Like the giant ferns and shit like that. Yeah. In 2014, Northwestern University geophysicist Stephen Jacobson and University of New Mexico seismologist Brandon Schmant found pockets of magma deep within the Earth beneath North America, 400 miles deep, 644 kilometers. Previous to this discovery, scientists had found pieces of ringwoodite inside a diamond that had been spewed out of a volcano in Brazil from the same depth as the North American magma pockets. Not only is this mineral the only sample that exists from within the Earth, that humans are in possession of, but it acts like a sponge. Ringwoodite attracts hydrogen and traps it in solid form. The magma pockets in North America being at the same depth as the ringwoodite that was coughed up in Brazil makes for the potential of a shitload of water sitting beneath the surface of our planet, possibly oceans worth of water. Scientists have also found evidence of a big-ass water reservoir beneath eastern Asia that is at least as much water as the Arctic Ocean. Now, I don't believe this is fully liquid water. This is water-saturated rock. This kind of gets back to what we were talking about with the crust being so thin Mm -hmm. at the bottoms of the ocean. I'm not sure the percentage of water molecules in the rock that deep beneath the Earth's crusts, like, you know, 400 miles. Mm -hmm. But studies of ocean floor rocks have shown them to be up to 15% water. So it's possibly more than that so far down. This was found studying seismic activity. It was noticed that seismic waves dampened over an area in Eastern Asia, acting like they do when they encounter water, as water slows the speed of waves a bit. If this theory is true, then it would be the largest body of water on the planet, and it also explains how we have a continuous amount of water on Earth. So what happens is all this water is soaking in through the ocean, and it's soaking all the way down until it heats up, and then it's boiling up through the rock, and then creating more water. That's why it just hasn't dried up. So mainstream science has sort of a hollow earth theory itself, you know? Well. It's just got, you know, water. Right. I would just, I would be likely to believe that a reservoir of water 
or water-soaked rock could exist oh, underneath. Yeah. You I don't mean, have that's to, kind that, of, I mean, that... That's, that's kind of hollow. Yeah. I mean... Kind of, but not really, not, because... Not the same hollow earth that all these other people right, are talking about, Right, where it's hollow still, through and through this kind is, of thing. This is... I believe maybe, yeah, there's, like, pocket. I mean, we haven't... It's not like we've been able to cut the earth in half and no, look no. exactly, you know, pull it apart and be like, oh, so this is what's in the middle. Now, another recent thing that has been possibly discovered... So the accepted theory of the creation of the moon is that 4.5 billion years ago, Earth collided with a Mars-sized mass that is called Thea. All of the Earth, all of the heat generated caused the planets to melt together, basically. And before cooling, some bits spun off. That made the moon. Recently, Harvard University researchers think they may have, may have identified signs that point to the possibility that only part of the Earth melted and parts of the old Earth are beneath the present-day Earth's mantle. So the other planet didn't melt the entirety of Earth, so maybe one hemisphere remained how it was, and so that puts some continents under the crust. So that's also kind of hollow Earth. Interesting. And that is about all I have for hollow Earth theory today. That's all you have. That's you all say. I have. What about you, Joanna? you have anything else? I don't have anything else to add other than that, you know, there's some, there's some interesting, there's some interesting theories. Yeah. But all in all, I do not believe that the earth is hollow. I don't really think it's hollow, but I'm open to the idea that it could be. I'm not even open to the idea that it could be. I'm just like, no, it's, it's that solid round core of iron. That's what's going on. I That's Like I said, most... I, I'm open to the idea that maybe there's like little pockets here and there. More of a, Under yeah. the crust, but I would not. Not completely as, hollow. No, it is definitely not completely hollow. I don't think there's any fucking atmospheres or oceans. Well, Lizard people? Yeah. Agartha? You don't think there's Agartha? No, I don't think the temples were openings Nazi to hollow Nazi flying Earth. saucers? Nope. No Nazi flying Hitler's saucers. Hitler's not living beneath Antarctica? Nope. No. Nope. I'm going to say nope to all of that. The big nope. Got the big nope from me on that one. All right. Well, I guess that's about all we got for you all today. So thank you very much for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. Take care now. Oh, be sure to check out Cthulhu Art on Facebook. Yes, definitely check that out. Do you enjoy the Stranger Than podcast? Please let us know. Rate and comment on iTunes. Check out and like our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Stranger Than Podcast. Our Twitter at underscore Stranger Than or drop us an email, strangerthanpodcast at gmail.com. That's strangerthanpodcast, all one word, at gmail.com. Also, feel free to email us any strange, mysterious, or misunderstood stories or topic suggestions that you'd like to share or hear about.